Está me escutando, Moisés? Sim, sim. É, eu acabei de escrever é. lá para o Anthony para pedir ele para uh -huh. entrar. Tá. Só estou testando aqui, vamos ver. Tá bom, eu vou só dar um pulinho no banheiro, pegar uma água e já volto. Tá. Vou começar o grupo, aquela, aquele evento agora, tá? Hã? Como assim? Não, não, só porque eu vou fechar aqui a porta agora. Tem esse, tem esse evento que eu estou organizando. Eu te mandei um convite, mas ele, palestra do Indiano. Das quatro às seis. Indianos? Não, um indiano. Você vai ter que pegar alguma coisa aqui para pegar logo, exatamente. Legal. Ah.
Hi, Anthony. Hey, good morning. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good yeah, afternoon. How are you? Fine. And okay. well, there it is still morning, isn't it? It's, yes, uh, it's 11 a.m. Okay. 11 o'clock yeah. in the morning, yes. Mm -hmm. Good Hi, afternoon. Yeah. How are you feeling? You're feeling better? I'm feeling much better, yes. Yeah, yeah that is better. Uh, still, uh, still a little weak, but. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry to bother you. But, but the spirit is strong. <laughs> <laughs> the spirit is strong. Yeah. That's what matters. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. what matters, right. Right. I'm sorry to be uh, to impede on you know this lecture when when you don't feel so well. No, no, no. You know, yeah. I yeah. I mean, it's it's one of those things. You know, it it happens, and at this age, you know, you can expect all these little things here and there, and uh, uh, so we have to deal with it. That's it. Hmm. You know. Yeah, I you know I I also had a you know not a very good uh, year because my father uh, passed away. You know, you know about a. Um, well, a little over a month ago. So I had to go to oh. India on an emergency basis. Oh. And these days, you know, you can't just go to an airport and board a flight. You have to go through yes, these COVID tests. Uh -huh. Very complicated and it's very anxiety uh -huh. creating, you know, because you never know if your test will turn out to be positive or negative. Uh -huh. <laughs> so yeah. anyway, yeah. So, so these health related things have, you know, and of course we are at an age that all of these things can be expected. Yeah, you know, so. Yeah, you told us your father passed away. Uh, it's a, a couple of months ago, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. right, yeah. right. Yeah. Very recently. I mean, he was old, you know, he was quite uh, old. So, you know, it's not that, you know, it, it, it was unexpected. But I think the way he went is, is un well, it's usual in the sense he had a fall. And after that, that was it. Mm. So it, it wasn't anything else. You know, he, he seemed to be okay. But, yeah, he just had a fall and... Once you break something, then I think it just goes yeah, down. You, you lose the willpower you know, to continue. Yeah, living. right, right. Yeah. And he also decided, I think, yeah, it was time to go, yes. So mm. anyway, um, mm. so how well, are things in Brazil us... these days? Oh, <laughs> so good, <laughs> so bad, so good. Today we we got the, the, the very good news that our economy is in recession. Is oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is uh, is Bolsonaro it will be able to finish his term or will he be well, kicked out before that? Yeah, he'll finish the term, but he's losing completely his competitiveness for the next elections. Right. I right. I would say that uh, the the former uh, judge uh -huh. from uh, car wash operation uh, can can be the, the second candidate. No. It's going to be Lula and him. But right. Lula is 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 doing uh, pretty well so mm -hmm. far, and there, there is the possibility of an alliance with the former governor from São Paulo, mm -hmm. who was formerly from the PSDB, from right. Fernando Henrique's party, and uh, uh, there is this. Uh, he changed the party. He's going to another party, and there is this invitation that he would be the vice president candidate from. For Lula's candidate. Uh -huh. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So I guess uh, just so we have a couple of people here already right, you know, Irina Zurba and Hanok and Bruno. Yeah. Yeah. So just so Bruno, give us a few minutes, yeah. you know, we're just chatting a little yeah. bit away here to give a few <laughs> minutes for our people to join us. Yeah. Hello, Irina. Hello, Bruno. Hello, Hanok. Hello, Hello, Bruno. Hello. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, thanks for inviting. Irina, uh, are you from Russia? I am from Ukraine, but I live oh, Ukraine. in the United States. Welcome. Oh, you live in I the think. States. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the last name is... Could be Russian or Ukrainian. Yes, yeah. Sla Slavic origin, yeah, Ukrainian. Yeah. <laughs> is Slavic, but different from uh, Polish names, because uh, the uh, Polish names, they have a very different structure. Polish is also Slavic language. You know, it's like whole group of languages, like Czech, yeah, but but Polish, it's Russian, Russian, Ukrainian, Bulgarian. Yeah, yeah, they yeah that that's that's it. Uh, uh, Russian, Ukrainian, Bulgarian—they are similar. They're more similar than Polish and uh, and uh, hung well, Hungarian is not Slavic. Hungarian is yeah, completely out of the yeah. Yes, Hungarian is something. Yeah. No similarity with it's like Ugro. Yeah. Not liar. Yes. Is not liar. <laughs> uh, just like uh, the the Basco region in Spain, 
Mm-hmm. Euskera. Yeah. Right. It's a totally different language. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the Hungarians doing their own thing as, as usual. Yes, as usual. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Hungarians are doing their usual. Yeah. <laughs> So Bruno, uh, uh, where are you from? I'm originally from Germany, from Germany, but I'm working in Mexico. Ah, I'm living and working in Mexico. I mm-hmm. see. Okay. Right. And yeah, do, do, exploring things with Moises and Antonio. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm and you, hoping you, that... You are, uh, where are you from originally? Uh, I'm originally from India. Uh-huh. Uh, but yes, as you can very well uh, recognize that I have a Portuguese uh, last name. Yeah, but, uh, but that is because of the well, you know, at some point they were, you know, the Portuguese were in India. So, uh, uh-huh. uh, but then there are these two different uh, communities. I'm from the eastern side, and the more recognizable Portuguese influence community is actually on the western side. But we Goa. actually have yeah, Goa, which is Goa and other, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. But I'm from the eastern side, which is lesser known. Uh, but we yeah. pretty much have, uh, you know, uh, very similar uh, names and uh, Portuguese names. In fact, it was it was very interesting when I first went to Brazil in 1987. Uh, you know, I, 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 there were a lot of words that I heard in Portuguese, but we also use those same words in my own language. Okay. Uh, so clearly, of course, you know, they were they are, they are loan words, but the loan words, uh, uh, they may have some Arab uh, origin. I'm not so sure, uh, but mm-hmm. a lot of the words. So, for example, uh, you know, for window, we say janela, and in Portuguese, we say janela, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and then for... Uh, for key for a key you say uh, chavez uh, and we say yeah. chavi 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 uh, yeah chavi uh, and chavi so okay. th- there are certain kinds of words that we actually use which are so almira for example uh-huh. uh, you know and i think in portuguese it's almira i think for the oh, cupboards yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah? yeah 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 so there are a lot of these kinds of words that i dis- actually i discovered them in brazil <laughs> interestingly enough <laughs> okay I mean, I was using them in India, but then I discovered mm. them in, in Brazil. But you also have Portuguese uh, uh, ascendancy or, uh, I mean, you're... We may right have, now. yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's. A, I tried at one time to see if I could trace back, but, uh, but no, there is definitely, it's just that question is how, you know, where exactly the link, when the links actually begin. But th- there have been priests and so on, and in fact... Uh, mm-hmm. You know, the, we are basically a Catholic community. I mean, uh, mm. you know, a Catholic community in, in a in a context of uh, on the eastern side, of course, is uh, a Muslim Muslim community. Majority is Muslim in the part mm. that is now Bangladesh today. Uh, so, which is mm-hmm. really a Muslim Muslim sort of context, yes. but small, you know, Catholic community. Oh, and I the see. Goans, of course, are largely in a Hindu context. So mm-hmm. they are also Catholics, uh, you know, Roman Catholics. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, no, I think there is a very long tradition uh, of that Portuguese influence. Uh, in fact, we do have some, you know, so, I mean, there are some interesting words, which, you know, mainstream, like Bengalis, which is, which we are part of the community, they don't have those words, but we have mm-hmm. them. Like, so compadre, actually, we don't use compadre, compadre. but we say compu. So Kompu actually <laughs> comes from Kompadre, actually. <laughs> so, you know, but we are the only community that uses those words and who knows what it actually means, not anybody mm-hmm. else, you know. So it's, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, in Mexico, that's very, very common. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, I think language is one of those things uh, with, uh, with the European expansion, I think the, all kinds of influences uh, went along, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, we always think of, you know, Chile as, a, as an Indian invention, but it isn't. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it came with the Portuguese from somewhere yeah. else, from South America. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, a, yeah, obviously over time, you think it's yours or, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. so. yeah. it, 
Germany, it's with the potatoes, no? Everything right. is about potatoes. And yeah, 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 <laughs> um, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know right. what they what they had to eat before the potatoes. Yes, came I to know. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, what, yeah. really, what? Yeah, what did they actually have without potatoes? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> they starved. <probably>. Uh, <laughs> we right. save with potatoes. Uh, well. I think uh, uh, two questions. First, we are uh, broadcasting this, or we are transmitting on the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I will start the transmission now. And, and the second is if you can also record, just in case something doesn't work well with the live transmission, then we have the recording, because then I, I upload in, in our YouTube channel. Okay. Yeah, actually, I, I, okay. I, I invited a couple of colleagues, but they said mm -hmm. they, they, they couldn't participate and they, they would like to have a look at it uh, after, uh, afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, would be, I think it would be good, a good idea. Okay. Sure. Great. Mm -hmm. okay, should I get started? Was that want to do the introductions? One me two? Okay. No, I think you, you could do that. Uh, okay. So, let me, let me get my, uh, my notes here. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us. I know um, this is, I think, is the, sec the sixth or seventh event of this uh, series on, uh, of seminars on comparative political economy 2020 21 on, on Asia. And it's a great pleasure of us, for us you know, to have uh, Professor Anthony da Costa, who is an eminent scholar in global studies and professor of economics at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Um, uh, I just want to make a, a change in the program. Unfortunately, you know, our commentator, Professor Maria Cristina Cachamali, who's a professor at the School of Economics and Administration and the Latin American program at Univers Universidade de São Paulo, you know, she fell ill over the last week. It seemed like we, we had been hit by uh, Professor, uh, professor Da Costa, also fell ill uh, over Thanksgiving, and so we're afraid <laughs> that we're not going to make it. But our, our commentator fell ill, and she's in the hospital right now. And she excused herself, asked us not to, uh, to, to excuse herself to all of you, you know, but she, unfortunately she was totally unable you know, to participate. So unfortunately, you guys are going to have to deal with myself and in, uh, in Moisés you know, making the initial round of comments, but I hope you know, the public will you know, be able to make a lot of comments and, and, uh, and criticisms of the, of the talk. So, so these are the, the major changes you know, in the program. So this, this event is organized by, uh, by, uh, by a number of institutions, you know, the Economic Sociology Network of Rio de Janeiro, which is my own graduate program in political sociology, uh, the graduate program in anthropology sociology of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and the sociology program, the graduate program in sociology of the Federal University of, of Rio de Janeiro, they are in the Rio de Janeiro region. And this is jointly with the, the graduate program in comparative studies on Americas of the University of Brasilia, of, of which you know, Professor Moisés is one of the directors. And we have the support you know, uh, of the Economic Sociology Research Committee of the Brazilian Society of Sociology. So I'd like to just acknowledge you know, their support and their, their kind of in divulging you know, this, uh, this, this lecture. So as I said, you know, uh, Professor Da Costa you know, is a professor at the uh, University of Alabama in Huntsville. Over the last uh, 30 years, he taught also at the University of Melbourne as chair and professor of contemporary Indian studies at the Copenhagen Business School, as the AP Moller Mask uh, professor of Indian studies at the National University of Singapore and the University of Washington as professor of comparative international development. I'm not going to read it through all. Everything he has written, you, know, you, you, you receive the abstract. You know, he's an accomplished scholar you know, in, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of development, comparative international development, has worked on uh, steel autos, IT. His latest paper is on the handling industry in India, and uh, he also has an, uh, a very broad you know, uh, view of comparative development, had studied you know, this, uh, this topic so in China, Japan, and India, and South Korea. And he's been interested in the issues of capitalism, globalization, state, economic, nationalist, development, innovations, industrial restructuring, employment challenges, international migration professional, he's been working uh, lately on that, in wealth and inequality, which is, uh, comes out in this uh, some more recent work. So, and he's written or uh, edited dozens of books, published books, chapters, and journal actors, and lecture widely. He has received multiple fellowships, including the Fulbright Highs American, uh, Fulbright Highs American Institute of Indian Studies and the Abe Fellowship from the Japan Foundation. He contributed to research efforts for, of multilateral organizations and served on numerous academic and professional committees. So it's a, with great, great pleasure you know, that uh, I give the word you know, to Professor Da Costa, my good friend, Antonio Da Costa. Anthony, you have the, you have the floor. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Antonio and uh, Moises, for or putting this together. And of course, uh, I also thank all the organizations behind this uh, effort. Uh, uh, it's quite clear that uh, a lot of work has gone behind the series itself. And uh, I wish uh, I had known a little bit earlier about the series, then I could have also listened to some of your uh, other speakers as well. But I have read uh, through the abstracts uh, of those. And so then I will uh, proceed uh, with that basis and sort of uh, uh, move on with my lecture. So I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen. Uh, let me just hold on here. Uh, slide show from start and oops. Uh, this is always share screen. Okay, share. And okay, can you uh, see the screen now? Yes, yes, okay. we can. You can see the screen. Okay, all right. I'm going to reduce this. All right. So, uh, so anyway, so this is a uh, this is uh, an idea that I have been working for a number of years. Uh, the idea that capitalism in 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 the in broadly in the global south, although I have not done. Uh, too much empirical work in the global south per se, but I have taken uh, a lot of uh, 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 sort of work into understanding the process of capitalist development in India uh, in a very sort of wide ranging uh, sort of way. And uh, from simple observations, it is quite clear that the kind of things that go on in economic development in a country like India is not quite what we would expect given the knowledge that we have about economic development in general. It, not only starting from the sort of classical sort of uh, forms of development in the industrialized West, although they are no longer in, uh, industrialized as such today, uh, but also in the latecomers uh, such as some of the smaller latecomers such as in, uh, in the East Asian economies. And then of course, more recently, a very big economy and kind of quite an unprecedented type of development in the case of China. So uh, this sort of is the sort of background to which uh, I, of course, situate uh, India. And of course, even though my understanding is somewhat limited uh, or at, at least not as in great depth as I have of India, nevertheless, I think I can see some parallels and but also some big differences uh, in terms of the way these economies have evolved uh, over time. So they, it's quite clear when I looked at your comparative political economy series, uh, really the, 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 the main thrust of most of these talks that I, I, I observed, and meant most of them were on China, although there was also in the case of South Korea and, and Brazil uh, as well, I think Antonio uh, presented on Brazil. Um, it's, it's, it's really about institutional change. And of course, when we say institutional change, we are really talking about the way uh, rules and regulations and uh, you know, forms of intervention, the way they are sort of either designed or they spontaneously emerge to shape the certain sort of economic development sort of outcomes. Some are of course, you know, very spontaneous, others are more deliberate and, and conscious. Uh, and in the end, of course, they try to produce certain kind of quote unquote desirable uh, economic outcomes. So clearly the role of the state or to, more, to put it more precisely, the developmental role of the state is important. And the contemporary discussions, at least uh, from what I gathered from reading the abstracts of the, of the various presentations made uh, in this series was a lot of it focused on industrial upgrading, uh, regional innovation systems, you know, uh, small and medium uh, enterprises and their decentralized network, especially in, in, in places like in Taiwan, for example, so, so these are some interesting questions, no doubt, about contemporary capitalism. But it seems to me that the, the, the papers uh, probably, and of course I am guessing here, probably did not really talk about capitalist trajectories. Trajectories in the, in the very big sense. In other words, what is the path of development in a bigger sense uh, in these kinds of countries? How might they differ from other places? And so on. Uh, these are some of the, the, the issues that I will be touching upon, mainly the form and substance of 
the nature of contemporary capitalism uh, in India. Um, but in the end, I think all of these uh, uh, papers uh, investigate, even if they don't explicitly say so, really they are exploring some form of structural transformation. And when I say structural transformation, we, I have obviously you know, have something very specific in mind, and that is how these economies have moved away from agriculture to non-agricultural forms of economic activity. So that's the sort of crux of my, uh, my main sort of, uh, 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 sort of discussion, and that's what I'll focus on. So in the context of this background of the comparative political economy series, I have my own intellectual growth also has come out, and, and Antonia has already referred to them very generously, but I think they have been the building blocks of the way I am thinking these days. And so, for example, the first uh, book that you see is, is on the restructuring of the global restructuring of the steel industry. Brazil actually was part of that study as well, uh, along with some other uh, countries like South Korea and India and Japan as well. Uh, this one is the auto industry where I bring in uh, the, the role of Japan in transforming the Indian automobile industry. And the third one is on the information technology industry, but with a very specific sort of connection to the Japanese economy, because that, that's one economy that is, that is not really discussed uh, when it comes to the supply of human resources, uh, technical human resources, because much of the discussion, and rightly so, is with respect to the United States, which is the biggest sort of IT market. But given this sort of sectoral approach, then of course, I sort of began to think in some other bigger macro kind of way. And of course, probably this book, which was published in 2010, the, A New India, is, is probably the beginning of thinking about these bigger questions about trajectories. Uh, capitalist trajectory. So really ca capitalist trajectories, but as you can see the visually, you can see that it's really about uneven development. Uneven development is I think a very simple and yet a very sort of uh, interesting sort of concept to capture the way uh, economies around the world uh, sort of evolve and especially those economies in the global South. The others are about, you know, Asian, mostly about Asia, but obviously with other people I have worked with. This is on China and India. Uh, this is on, on, on South Korea, but more in terms of after its sort of fantastic sort of experience of growth and development. And the more recent two books are about, again, back to India where and, and this is something that I will be talking about more today about the question about agriculture and land in India and what does it mean for capitalist uh, trajectory. So the objective then of the presentation is to offer an alternative structuralist understanding why contemporary capitalist trajectories in the global South are, are different from the earlier, if you will, capitalist countries. And then I take on in the an important case of India and of course, India is studied, no doubt, by obviously India experts around the world, but, they, but India has always been in the shadows of China and East Asia because the trajectories are actually quite different. Uh, and the explanation that I use is to bring in two ideas that is compressed capitalism and lateness. And of course, I want to sort of show how capitalism is being compressed or squeezed uh, in a way that sort of allows the simultaneous coexistence uh, of you know, developments that are both sort of advanced uh, sort of forms of capitalism, but also there are regressive elements of this uh, capitalism. So, in, and, and I think this is something that probably one would notice it also in the case of, you know, whether it's Mexico or, or, or Brazil or Argentina and so on. Although obviously in some very different sort of ways, but. This is what I, I, I want to sort of emphasize this uneven and combined development that we see that represents both advanced and regressive elements of capitalism. So there are really three parts, uh, conceptual and methodological notes. And then I talk about compression and lateness in India. And then I provide some features of this con uh, compression uh, in India. So two interrelated concepts, uh, compressed capitalism and lateness. It's a macro historical political economy of development approach. I look at the world economy as the unit of analysis in the sense that uh, it, it's kind of a Wallastinian, Brodelian sort of approach, but at the same time, I, I am very, very sensitive to the local details. Uh, but in the end, I think the discussion of these trajectories 
must take place at a global level. I, I don't think you can uh, sort of nail it down at the national level and, and talk about trajectories, although that, that trajectory that, that, that one nation can exhibit is definitely can be an, analyzed from on its own terms, but I think in the end, it would be far richer to situate it in the larger global sort of context. All right, so that's sort of the background. So what is compressed capitalism? Okay, I mean, the, the very, I have a very straightforward understanding of what capitalism is. It's a market-based economic system, profit motive, you are extracting economic surplus through wage labor, and of course it's regulated by the state. So this is a very straightforward, simple definition of what capitalism is. Now the question of course is where does the source of compression come about? Now, the, 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 the starting point is that the diffusion of capitalism takes place in a very sort of uneven and combined way. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, referring to Celso Furtado, you know, he talks about internal colonialism, which again, doesn't get too much attention, but within large economies, such as the India, I mean, there is a considerable amount of regions that dominate other regions and so on. And there is a certain kind of colonialism that takes place within the country that also produces this uneven and combined uh, development. But in the end, it's the diffusion of capitalism that is very uneven across the world. And we can see it over, you know, over time and space. Historically, we can see that. Um, clearly, of course, starting points are different. The impacts are different. And of course, every country has gone through their particularly in the global South, different sort of influences from the colonial sort of uh, countries. And that has of course led to a certain kind of state response. Uh, the state response of course is a, a, a response to late capitalism in the sense that previously they were you know, dominated or subjugated by foreign powers or foreign influences. And of course, uh, once they became sovereign nations, then they tried to pursue a path of their own. And this is where, of course, the compression begins because in the end, what the states are trying to do is essentially narrow the gap, the, both the economic as well as the technological gap between the front runners and the latecomers. I mean, that's the general sort of process by which we see. But the, the interesting thing, of course, is that in theory, of course, we have a very good abstract understanding based on past historical experience as to what these processes might be, in what sequence they might follow, and so on and so forth. But the, I think the real challenge, of course, is that when we look at contemporary capitalism, and particularly in places like India, what you find is that there is no neat and clean sequencing of these types of processes. They're, you know, they're kind of they almost seem random, although I, I, didn't want to, I don't want to use the word random, uh, but they, 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 they are here and, you know, and, and you know, there, there are explanations for it, but yet they are not neat and clean as uh, you know, we might want them to be. And as if there is a certain linear sort of process by which there is going to be a capitalist uh, development. And the next point that I want to sort of mention that, that uneven arises precisely because there are other countries that are ahead. So in other words, the, so this, uh, this notion of combined development is really conceptually what it is saying is that because of the presence of others, the development sort of is influenced by that presence, which means that what latecomers do is dependent on what early countries have already achieved. And this again is, I think, in an interesting way, in a very dynamic sort of way to think about what are the possibilities or what are the limits of, let's say, the global south, all right? especially when it comes to uh, uh, manufacturing and industrialization. So this is, of course, Celso Furtado, and that's me, by the way, in 1987, uh, having a very long discussion about Brazil, which was kind of interesting. Um, so what is lateness now? When we talk about lateness of you know, the, the, the lateness, of course, has to do with the fact... Does somebody have a question or, or I, I don't know? Uh, okay. um, what is lateness? The so lateness is, of course, entry to industrial capitalism, and it is to lateness to material transformation to be like the West, and of course, you know, we, historically we have various degrees of lateness. I mean, 
you start off with UK, but then followed by Germany, US, you know, other parts of Europe, Japan, then comes, you know, India, Brazil, Latin America, East Asia, Southeast Asia, more recently, China, Vietnam. So there are, one can actually map these out in some order in terms of their lateness, lateness to entry, although difficult exercise, no doubt, but I think, you know, crudely, we can do that. So there is a temporal and spatial and institutional dimensions of lateness, and it has to do with the timing of entry. You know, how quickly you enter, you know, how much catch up you can do in what sectors, and then also identify some of the lagging sectors. So this is where I think this uneven development comes about because there are some sectors that are very dynamic, that are very global, they're globally oriented, very competitive. And yet there are many other sort of lagging sectors that tend to sort of pull the economy, you know, in, in some other kind of uh, uh, direction. Uh, and the quality of entry, of course, also varies. And in this uh, uh, sort of effort, institutions at the, at the time of entry are also very important because they could either foster or hinder the speed and process of capitalist development, uh, such as you know, institutions of you know, modernity, legal system. And, uh, and of course, there are legacy problems. E you know, every society has some baggage, you know, historical baggage that seems to get very, very difficult to get rid of. So, for example, ceremonialism is, is, is a concept that was used by, you know, Iris, uh, uh, you know, many years ago and talking about how the global developing countries generally have this notion about ceremonialism, which means that it's really about status and prestige and those kinds of things. And those things also have a hangover effect on the kind of trajectories that these countries can uh, experience. And this is a graph that we are all familiar with, and I think this this sort of is a way to think about you know this process of economic development, whereby you can see that there is a turning point in the 19th century, roughly around in the middle of the 19th century, a big turning point with the industrial revolution, and of course, the the West and its offshoots you know take off, and then of course followed uh, um, uh, uh, a bit later, about you know 100 years later, you see you know East Asia. And then, of course, you know, maybe another, you know, 25 years, you know, or 30, 40 years ago, you know, begin to see China and then the rest of the world. So clearly, this in itself captures the uneven economic development based on the ability to extract economic surplus differently. So clearly, it is a transitional kind of an issue whereby there is a shift from feudalism to capitalist production commercialization and profit making and application of knowledge and efficiency become the sources of this uh, turning point uh, for the different sort of regions uh, of the world. And latecomers, including China and other um, economies, including India, for example, they are all sort of trying to pursue this kind of a path. Uh, and, but lateness in itself is a, a, a factor to be considered only because they are influenced by what has happened previously, especially among the early uh, industrializers. To give you a visual sort of uh, 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 understanding, so this is Goldman Sachs's new Bangalore uh, campus, all right? So uh, nobody from this picture will imagine that this is actually in India, right? But if you look at the next picture, of course, this is, you know, small workshops, as you can see, People are you know, making probably garments or repairing certain things using certain very simple uh, machines uh, in some sort of uh, slum or favela as in the Brazilian case, uh, you know, in probably in Mumbai somewhere, all right? So these two visuals, of course, depict the kind of uneven development that I am making references to. And the question is, of course, how does this arise in the first place, right? So then let's look at this question about compression and lateness. So, now, uh, theoretically, and of course, this is very simplified and perhaps uh, somewhat reductionist, uh, but nevertheless, I think it helps us frame the problem. And that is, uh, when, you, when you look at the classical sort of uh, capitalist progression, you know, so you have this process called primitive accumulation, which is really the agrarian transition. So you can think of Victorian England as, you know, as that period when you have the formation of workshops, and the movement of basically peasants uh, into these workshops as factory workers. So work was being organized under factories 
And you have this process of primitive accumulation, which essentially refers to disposition of the peasants from the land. Now, this disposition can take a variety of forms, including very, very violent forms. And this has, of course, taken place across the world in different contexts. Uh, certainly, we know in the case of uh, uh, Brazil, uh, in fact, I, I, I read uh, uh, you know, uh, many years ago a, a number of novels by uh, George Amado, <laughs> and he tells me about uh, of, of, of the Brazilian sort of plantation in the Northeast, uh, you know, in terms of what was really going on in terms of land ownership and so on and so forth, how land was being, you know, sort of usurped by certain groups of, you know, uh, people, dominant groups of people. So this is a form of primitive accumulation, the separation of peasants from the land, which of course then leads to what we would call an industrial workforce. And in that process, of course, the state becomes a very, very important player in regulating and managing that process. Initially, perhaps less so, but over time they fine tune the institutions. And as a result of which also they, they foster what I would call capitalist maturity. In other words, local capitalists, local commercial interests become you know, very mature and they know how to manage in the world of capitalist competition. So you have the appearance then of, or the formation of formal markets and the disappearance. And so this is the thing, the disappearance, almost complete, although there could be pockets here, here and there, but disappearance of petty commodity production, which is the small scale owner operated kind of production systems, small scale sort of production. Now let's come to late capitalist, what I call compression. Now in countries like India and many other places, this primitive accumulation is still going on. It's not a complete process. In fact, this agrarian transition that is moving away from agriculture to non-agricultural activities, this process is unresolved. And this, I think, is the crux of the problem of, let's say, the kind of development that India is witnessing. Uh, although the discussion is not really centered around, at least in the mainstream. In India too, you have state capitalism or in late, in late capitalist countries, you also have state capitalism. In fact, more so because they want to play this catch up game and in the process of course, contribute to capitalist maturity. There is a certain amount of leapfrogging that is going on. So certain types of sectors and industries, uh, states can help narrow the gap, you know, technological and, and other institutional gaps within certain types of sectors. So you can think of, you know, the more traditional heavy industry, like say steel industry or automobile industry or machinery industry. These are things that countries like India, Brazil, you know, and other larger sort of mature uh, global South countries can actually do. They can undertake these kinds of things. Uh, in addition to, of course, moving on to other things. And of course, you know, Brazil, we know of, uh, you know, um, uh, aerospace, for example, uh, uh, you know, India, we also know of the space area. So these are obviously pockets of efficiencies, if you, if you will. Uh, but the other interesting element to this uh, uh, late capitalism is that the states are creatures of, I mean, states are generally creatures of society, but in these kinds of cases, the state is often captured or what, what it amounts to a fragmented state because there are multiple competing interests that are impinging on the nature of the state. So sometimes the state has a very hard time in negotiating with all of these types of groups, pressure groups, so to speak. As a result of which also the policies don't tend to be very clear cut. They are often kind of, you know, hodgepodge of, of different things trying to meet different sort of needs. So this is also the nature of, 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 of a late sort of, you know, uh, capitalist development where the state is not quite the role that it plays. And finally, of course, the, the very distinctive feature of this late capitalism is that there is a persistence of petty commodity production, which means that small scale production remains very, very important uh, in many of these economies and certainly in the case of India, which is in contrast to the disappearance in the earlier sort of classical sort of transition uh, whereby the, you know, the, dis the small producers virtually disappear and capital becomes organized on a very large scale. So the overall in impact of this kind of process, of course, is that you have uneven development, 
or what we call economic dualism, or you have what we call enclave uh, development. So the agrarian question then becomes the sort of a very important sort of uh, entry point to discuss what is the nature of capitalism in a country like uh, India. We know what is uh, primitive accumulation. It's really the origin of capital. And in the context of developing countries, of course, they, they uh, mechanically, at least we can say that really what it involves is expelling the so-called surplus labor, the Louisian turn, so to speak, right? To expel the surplus labor from the countryside so that agriculture becomes more productive with fewer people engaged in agriculture. Now, interestingly, of course, in the global context, we know that the European countries have had an, a wonderful opportunity in the earlier part of the 20th century or even uh, late 19th century to send out their surplus people to North America, South America, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and so on. Estimates show that about 30 million in the 19th and early 20th centuries, people have moved from Europe to all of these places. And the share of these emigrants is, is high relative to the total population of those, of those uh, societies. Now, this is, uh, this is something that is generally forgotten in the scheme of this discussion about primitive accumulation. In other words, I think it would be an interesting question. I don't have the answers to them, but I think it would be an interesting question. Where would the Scandinavian countries be without this possibility of expelling their surplus people at one time to the new world, so to speak, right? I think this is an interesting question that I think we should keep in mind. But in the end, agriculture then becomes an instrument, I think, to provide, uh, uh, to generate sort of demand and income, which would then, of course, sort of foster industrialization and non-agricultural activities. In other words, we expect through capitalist development uh, that the, the agricultural sector will become less important over time, which, of course, the, the rich countries will tell us. Uh, in fact, many other countries will, uh, will tell us that agriculture is no longer that important as it uh, used to be. So when we look at the sort of uh, structure of the Indian economy, India in some ways, at least in terms of its contribution to GDP, that is a sectoral composition uh, of GDP, you can see that India is following a very traditional, conventional kind of a trajectory in the sense that share of agriculture to GDP is falling. Now, this is expected with economic development, economic growth, and uh, with the rise of non-agricultural sectors, we, we can expect that the value of agriculture to GDP will fall. And, uh, but interestingly enough, India's manufacturing sector, although it does take off in the 50s with a great degree of state intervention, but then it begins to sort of flatten out and almost, I would say, stagnant today. And that's manufacturing. And of course, uh, the residual category services it takes off and obviously has, has reached almost 60% uh, in the case of India, which generally you would think that for an economy like India with low per capita incomes, you would think that manufacturing or industry would, would be a, a form a greater sort of component uh, to India's GDP, but it is not the case. And, and this is where the, I think the anomaly begins, right? And the other interesting thing to note here, this dotted line that you see is actually the high value services, which is finance, insurance, real estate, and business services. And many of these services are actually tradable, which means they are exported. So it's a very peculiar structure that we notice that at one level, it's very conventional that the agricultural sector has fallen, industry correspondingly has risen somewhat, but has plateaued out but services has taken off and more importantly, high value services seem to be taking off uh, as well. So in this sort of context, of course, then the question is, is there a Louisian term? And I leave it as a question at the moment. I think it's important to just sort of keep that in mind. And I have updated this information with more recent data. Although again, you know, in, in, in India, the data is generally good, but not always very reliable depending on who is in charge and what's going on. And especially these days with the, with the government that we have in India, a lot of times they manufacture data these days. 
Uh, but nevertheless, these are official uh, statistics. But again, the same trends can be seen. In fact, services have gone up. Uh, you can see that industry is kind of almost stagnating, in fact, in the more recent years. And of course, you have uh, the agricultural sector has reached a point where it's not falling any further. Uh, to give you a contextual understanding of India's uh, agriculture versus, say, China, China is now less than uh, something around you know, 9 or 8 percent of GDP, whereas India is still about a little over uh, 20 percent. So obviously, there is still a, a, a big difference even in the, in, in the agricultural sector, but that's also stagnating in India. And then you have the high value services, uh, which is, I mean, basically equal to the value of agriculture. So which again is, it reflects a certain kind of anomaly. Uh, and this anomaly, of course, is nothing other than the fact that Indian capitalism is actually quite compressed. In other words, certain types of sectors that, that are supposedly sectors of the future, they emerge much earlier. Now, when you look at the composition of employment, you will find, of course, that this is where there is no Luisian term, because what you see is that agriculture remains a very, very dominant sector, even though there has been somewhat of a decline in the employment share, but it is still about 50%. So 50% of India's workforce is still tied to agriculture. And I think this is, is what I mean that by the fact that you, one has to understand what is going on in agriculture in order to understand the trajectory of Indian uh, capitalism. Now, without going into all of these details, I'm, I mean, obviously these notes will be available. Uh, you can look at it, but what is really going on? And I think some of the important developments is that this land has become uh, uh, an important issue in the, in the context of India. Uh, there, there is no discussion about redistribution of land anymore. There used to be, but really no real discussion. Uh, land holdings are getting very small in India, which of course is consistent with the small scale type of production that I referred to earlier. Uh, and there are of course good reasons as to why that is the case, you know, inheritance laws and so on and so forth. But there are also other reasons why land is become, land holdings are becoming smaller. Um, and this is the feature that I referred to earlier is that uh, the rise of the petty commodity producers. In other words, small scale, individual owned uh, types of uh, uh, enterprises, which try to make a living. And I say make a living because these are not uh, enterprises that are highly profitable and income generating. They, in, they generate enough income for almost like a subsistent type of existence. But there are lots of these petty commodity producers, both in the countryside, but also in the urban sort of uh, areas. Something that I think we would find across the world in the global south. Uh, and they are both waged and unwaged. So obviously a lot of family labor is also uh, involved. Now, the other interesting development that has emerged in India is that Agriculture, basically there is a crisis in Indian agriculture and you know, one can get into a lot of details about that, but I will not go into it perhaps in, in, in the question and answer session, I might bring some of those up. But really the, the one interesting development that has taken place in India in the last you know, couple of decades, let's say, is the rise of non-farm rural activities. So in other words, agriculture is not that profitable for the smallholders anymore. Uh, so what they do then is that they tried to find non-agricultural types of activities in the countryside or they migrate to the cities. But one must also understand that Indian migration, although it has been taking place, is actually quite slow. Nothing like what China has experienced, certainly nothing like the level of uh, urbanization that Latin America has witnessed. And I think partly because of their earlier sort of uh, sort of uh, independence in the 19th century. Uh, obviously, this process of migration takes place in India and, uh, and, and it, it can be also seasonal, but it is slow compared to say China or some other countries, all right? So this is another very interesting kind of a development and the rise of this non-rural activities, largely construction, some simple services and transport, in other words, you know, buses, trucks, or whatever, um, that sort of rural services, but they're all precarious forms of employment. Uh, this, I think, is the new development. So what is happening is that 
the people are not leaving the countryside and the people are not necessarily experiencing a rapid increase in their incomes, even though they have now diversified some of their economic activities uh, into these non-agricultural types of activities. But in the end, they are still very precarious uh, forms of, of uh, livelihoods. So this is one example of this kind of development that is taking place. It, gradually, there is an encroachment on the agricultural land for non-agricultural purposes, but agriculture in itself has not become a very, very profitable. In fact, there is a crisis. So what kind of then structural transformation has India experienced? Uh, you can see, and this is consistent with what I have already said, the declining share of agriculture through GDP, the declining share of the labor force as well, but still very, very high uh, in agriculture. Now here, of course, there is a divergence of agricultural output for agricultural workers and non-agricultural output for worker. So this is where, of course, you begin to see the differentiation taking place whereby agriculture still remains a drag on the economy, whereas non-agriculture in some limited sense takes off. But again, as I have earlier indicated that essentially the kinds of uh, employment that is generated are of the sort of petty commodity type of systems. In other words, small scale, not very high incomes and so on. So the, the features then of course of this compression can be seen in terms of what kind of a state does India have? Clearly, of course, you know, we, it's, it's, it's a very non-cohesive, you know, to use, uh, you know, Peter Evans's uh, term, you know, the, the kind of, you know, uh, fragmented kind of a state, if you will. It's, it's, it's partly development, but partly it is not. Uh, so somewhere in between. And there are, of course, pockets of efficiency, and you'll find that in Brazil, you'll find that in India, you'll find that probably in, in Nigeria as well, but they're only pockets. They, it, it doesn't sort of uh, uh, cover the entire economic system. Uh, uh, there is bureaucratic sort of uh, fragmentation. Uh, and of course you have, you know, and of course there are very, some very specific sources of state fragmentation, especially in India. Uh, in fact, the state is actually overextended in, in India without the necessary sort of capacity to handle the matters. And this is partly a, a, a result of the sort of the kind of democratic sort of institutions that India inherited and internalized. Uh, so in some ways, this is a very positive thing, but it does have its sort of uh, uh, you know, challenges. In other words, to manage a very large heterogeneous society with one leg in the past, and then one leg trying to be in the future. I think this is a very, very difficult task for a state. And of course, India is a federated system, which means that again, there are certain uh, uh, issues that are only handled by the, the local state authorities. So this makes the task of the role of the state also very, very difficult, even though today's state, today's government, and particularly the political leadership is trying to play a little bit of, of, of a strong strongman type of uh, approach, to managing some of these things. Uh, uh, but overall, I think the state is very, very fragmented, partly because of the kind of institutions, but also because of the democratic expectations uh, of, of the people. The citizens are highly politicized, but the institutions are not very strong, all right? So this is a very peculiar kind of uh, state that we are referring to. Now, when you talk about then this uh, trajectory, of course, you can see that there is a certain amount of dynamism, but not in agriculture. And this is, this is I think, where the real challenge is. Uh, weak intersectoral linkages between agriculture and industry. So the residual services has taken off. Uh, land is economically unattractive, but people hold onto land as non-agricultural alternatives are dismal. So in other words, going to the urban areas to find alternative sources of employment, they find some, so construction could be one of those things, especially when economic growth is high, that's the time when a lot of construction activities take place and a lot of seasonal workers then move from the, from the countryside. But once construction stops, when growth slows down, these people have no other option but to go back to their uh, villages. So this is where I think we are beginning to see that the 
non-agricultural activities are also very limiting in terms of transforming or having a multiplier effect on the agricultural uh, sector. So there is a very uh, interesting author who's no longer with us, Kalyan San Sanyal, who actually has a very interesting way of looking at this, this idea of this uh, people who are outside of the orbit of capital. In other words, there is what we call a floating population. You want, if you want, you can call them in, in the Marxist terms, the reserve army of labor. They're all there, you know, they're floating, you know, they're all over the place. They have no address, they, do, they, they don't have any, any regular jobs, you know, they sort of go from one day to the other. And there are millions of such people uh, around in, in, in India, do, in different places. So this is an interesting kind of a, a phenomenon of late capitalism. And uh, the other interesting thing, of course, with late capitalism or late development in India, is that the Indian state, however, cannot be indifferent to these developments because it becomes a, a governmental, gov governmentality issue. In other words, how do you govern people? How do you govern people who have nothing? This I think is an interesting question. So because India is relatively well steeped into democratic practices and people's expectations of rights, then it means that the state also has to treat uh, the people in a certain way, which means there is what we call, what Partho Chatterjee, another very well-known uh, political theorist from India, uh, he talks about political society. And what he is basically saying is that because of the presence of such people who have no ties to capital as such, they must be somehow managed so that they don't become a source of problems, societal and political problems. So, and of course, there is also this notion of enlightenment, so which means that the state actually has to work in favor of those people and somehow give them something to get by. Now, what it does, of course, in the process, of course, then in many ways, it postpones the effects of this primitive accumulation or dispossession. In other words, this process of primitive accumulation, which is a critical part of capitalist trajectory, does not take place or is delayed indefinitely because of this notion that, well, the people have to be somewhat at least given something to look after themselves. This I think is, is something that is probably present in many other countries, but I think it's a, it's a way of putting a political lid on the so-called lumpen elements of society. So this I think is what makes the task of the state yeah, even more in, in talking about having a nice, neat and clean kind of um, approach to bringing about capital's uh, development. I don't need to go into the other sort of details other than to point out that the kind of industrialization that India is undergoing as in many other countries is increasingly more of the capital intensive kind, right? So there is limited employment. In fact, there is a phenomenon even in countries like India where there is abundant workers, jobless growth. So there is growth, but not many uh, jobs being created and mainly because of automation and mechanization. In fact, there is a, a phenomenon in India called premature deindustrialization, which of course, Roderick has, uh, Danny Roderick has referred to, uh, although I think the process is a little bit different in the case of India, uh, that this premature deindustrialization has many sort of uh, uh, causes uh, in the case of India. And I've already pointed out the stagnation of industry relative to the other sectors, particularly the services sector. It has to do with the fact that India is part of the global economy. Uh, uh, Indian businesses must adopt very similar types of technologies uh, in order to be part of the global economy, which also means then, then there is no a sort of uh, effort to adopt what we might call appropriate technologies. So for, to a capitalist, of course, it doesn't matter because the, the, the goal of the capitalist is not to generate employment, but to essentially increase his economic surplus. And for that purpose, then, if it is, if it is uh, uh, relevant for the capitalist to employ lots of people, they will. In fact, they do. There are lots of labor intensive activities in India at very sort of abysmal levels of uh, wages and work conditions. 
Uh, and capitalists sort of get away flouting all kinds of rules and regulations around that. But at the same time, there are also capitalists who are you know, very modern and very sort of commercially driven and globally driven, and they adopt the most recent sort of technologies in their sort of operations. So these two things obviously have very different outcomes in terms of what kind of jobs and what is the level of jobs and the level of wages that take place uh, in India. India is also faced with competition, interestingly enough, even within the South Asian region. So Bangladesh is a very interesting example. It's a, it's, you know, Bangladesh used to be considered to be a basket case when it came to the economy, and yet Bangladesh seems to exhibit some signs of dynamism, although still in the garments and textile sector, but it's very much uh, sort of positioned itself globally in that particular sector. In some ways, of course, the, it's, it's following the traditional sort of labor intensive industrialization and assuming, of course, if it goes right, then you know, we may see some other form of diversification uh, taking place. But what does it mean for India? I mean, India has had a very large textile and garments industry and also internationally oriented, uh, although the bulk of the demand is domestic, no doubt. Um, but nevertheless, it has to compete with countries like uh, Bangladesh. So in many ways also there is limited participation in the global economy precisely because of the presence or competitiveness of others. Similarly with China and East Asia, their presence limits the entry for others uh, such as India. So a lot of the work that gets done in India, I mean, it's not that India is cut off from the world economy, but a lot of it is contract work, precarious informal work, and of course the persistence of the uh, petty commodity sectors. So here's an example of you know, Bangladesh, you know, women increasingly entering the workforce, exporting garments under brand names, not Bangladesh's brand names, but obviously overseas multinational brand names and exporting huge volumes of, 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 of textiles and finished uh, garments. If you look at leather, leather of course is a very important export item even from India. In fact, India boasts the largest uh, cattle in the world. Uh, uh, Indians by and large do not eat beef, uh, but obviously the leather is used. But what you find of course is that a lot of the sort of low level uh, parts of the value chain are basically done in the developing world. And, you know, so pretty much India is doing a lot of that, although there are certain Indian brands also that have become global, a very small one brand I can think of, high design. I don't know if you've seen it in any airports or anything, but they, they make upscale products under their own brand and it is actually an Indian company. But much of the value added is actually in the richer countries, the developed world, the markets, where the markets are, or where there are some further sort of processing, the last stages of processing that takes place, which is essentially the branding aspects of it and various other products. So the, the dirty part, the polluting part, the low end part is in the developing countries and uh, the, the more sort of value adding part is in the developed world. This is a typical sort of you know, segmentation of, of global value chains. And this is of course for a product that countries like India, uh, perhaps even Brazil, I'm sure Brazil has a lot of leather uh, exports as well, uh, they would be involved with. The question of course is that, how do you then get into this end that is the higher value end in other words, what kind of brands do you create? So this of course is a global value chain type of an issue. And the question of course is where does the global South fit in all of this? And the fact that there are already present, that is the richer countries or the richer uh, well-known brands and so on, it makes it difficult for latecomers to also enter. Uh, China of course is the manufacturing superpower. We, have, we all know that clearly of course its presence and in fact, it's very astonishing that so many products that India consumes actually is made in China. And these are very simple labor intensive types of products. One cannot understand why Indians cannot produce it. And of course there are, I'm sure good reasons for it. It's not the wage cost, but I think it has to do with the fact the ability of Chinese enterprises to produce on very, very large scale. This I think is the advantage that they have the economies of, of scale is what the Chinese have. But here is the other sort of uh, twist to the whole story is that yes, labor intensive, India 
you know, uh, uh, you know, low value manufacturing and so on. And yet, of course, Indian companies are engaged in producing robots that essentially does this, presumably this manual work that is basically moving boxes and moving in, in basically warehousing, automated warehousing. Now, you know, warehousing activities are essentially can be done by people, but obviously they are not going that way because I suppose that it has to do with volumes, efficiency, and so on. So Indian capitalists are also using very, very, you know, recent vintages of technologies. So the persistence of the informal sector then, I mean, the, the data is very clear. You can see that the informal sector is, remains a, close to, you know, is the same number. The numbers don't seem to uh, seem to change. A very, very high figure of the so-called the persistence of the informal sector, right? Now, which means that whatever growth that takes place uh, is taking place in this sector, but obviously the growth rates are not high and agriculture is a big part of it, right? The problem, of course, is that with capitalist development or high growth, which India has been experiencing, in fact, this year, despite the pandemic, it has now the growth rates are beginning to recover, and they estimate it's about you know seven or eight percent, although probably because of the lower starting point because of the pandemic. Nevertheless, I think the growth rates in India will continue. That, that I don't think that should be a surprise. But the problem is, what is the nature of this growth? And I think that's the real question. And where does this growth come from? And what we find is that given the trajectory of India, capitalist trajectory in India, we find that much of the growth is largely in this informal sector. But clearly, of course, the jobs that are generated within the sector are of the insecure, precarious uh, types of employment. Now, in that sort of uh, context, then we find that you know, the, the, the wealthy in India have continued to expand. So to, to give you a very sort of rough sort of figures, you can see that there were in, 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 in 2012, you know, 59 billionaires, all right? US dollar billionaires we're talking about here. And by 2018, there were 141. Uh, I, 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 I recently written a paper which should be coming out sometime next year. Uh, and I pulled it out from the, 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 the analysis that I had done is that the collective wealth of Indian millionaires between 2000 and 2019 increased from 110 billion to 2.86 trillion, which averages to 3.76 billion per millionaire. Now, these numbers, uh, some, well, some people may say, well, you know, why is it surprising? Uh, it's a large country, so you're likely to have, you know, a, a few billionaires, a, a few wealthy people. But I don't think that's the issue. The issue is that the rich or the wealthy are getting wealthier in this context, just as the sort of the, the persistence of the petty commodity sector continues. So I think this is the, this is the thing that we want to, to look at, not so much the rise of the billionaires themselves, uh, although that in itself is also interesting because they're increasing their net worth uh, over time even more, right? So based on you know, uh, 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 Piketty's uh, and, his, uh, and his team, uh, we find that the high income uh, groups, so let's say the, the top 0.001% or 0.1% and so on, they seem to be growing much faster uh, uh, than let's say the, you know, whether the bottom 50% or the middle 40%. Uh, this is for China. You can see China uh, displays very similar uh, kinds of developments, although China has a better record because its full population has experiences much higher uh, uh, change than compared to, let's say, India. But of course, France and U.S. are of, of different categories. Uh, clearly, even though U.S. inequality is, is, is high, uh, nevertheless, is nothing like what China and India are experiencing. Now, this in itself, I think, is also a feature of, of late capitalism or compressed capitalism, whereby the wealthy appear very quickly and very, very visibly. Um, uh, this I think is certainly is noticeable in the case of, of India. So this is the divergence then you see in terms of the share of income. And this is based on, uh, on tax income rather than the survey data and based again on, on, on the uh, Piketty and company 
which of course is found in the World uh, Inequality Report. You can find it online. Uh, you can see that clearly there is a big sort of uh, divergence. And this divergence, of course, is, is, is indicative of the fact that the kind of trajectory that we are seeing, the capitalist trajectory that we are seeing, is not the kind of trajectory that we would have witnessed. Now think of Kuznets. Now, you know, Simon Kuznets talked about the uh, worsening of inequality uh, as growth sort of proceeded. Now, if you were to we if you were to follow that logic and take it to its uh, sort of or extend it uh, extend that logic, then it may appear that perhaps you know that maybe this inequality will get better, right? But I don't think so because the nature, the structural nature of the kind of development that countries like India is witnessing is is not something that will produce uh, increasing inequality unless, of course, there is a massive institutional overhaul. And this, of course, is a political question. And I don't think the country is ready for that kind of political sort of makeover. So in, in conclusion, then, I mean, it's quite clear that the aggregation question must be resolved. Or if it is unresolved, the type of trajectory that we see should not then come as a, a surprise uh, for us. Uh, late capitalism means that there will be room for leapfrogging, for compression, uh, but then the, the, but what will happen is that it will always remain somewhat incomplete. And the, the transformation will remain incomplete. Um, in fact, India is already, and even the government uses the term premature deindustrialization, which means that the, 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 the contribution of industry is no longer increasing. Uh, relative to uh, GDP, uh, and the incomes still remain low. Uh, in other words, although the incomes is growing, but then of course, if you look at, if you break down the income statistics, you know, in terms of poverty and so on, I mean, it's it, the picture is actually quite dismal, uh, and it has gotten worse because of the uh, pandemic uh, as well. Okay. The global participation also is very difficult for India, mainly because of China's presence. Late entry widens the technology gap. Now, I remember many years ago uh, reading about uh, this Chilean uh, sort of uh, economist, Hinke Lamart, and uh, you know he made a very interesting observation. And it was only in a sentence or two, I remember, in a, in, in, in a volume on, uh, on, on, on dependency theory, I remember. And he said that in the early stages, the technology gap is smaller, and therefore the ability for so-called you know, latecomers is, is probably easier to narrow that gap, which makes sense, intuitive sense. But today, of course, it means that the gaps have become very wide, and as a result of which also makes it very difficult to catch up. So obviously this requires further investigation in the sense that to what extent the, the widening gap actually has become worse and therefore becomes more difficult for uh, many countries in the global south to sort of narrow that gap. Economic dualism is a feature uh, of, of late capitalism in the sense that there is modern dynamic sector with enclave economies, but then there is a vast sort of petty commodity sector as well. So it's a very different kind of capitalism that we are witnessing. Its lateness is both the past, in other words, you know, there's that hangover, but also the future is now in the sense that there are pockets of efficiency and there is an attempt to move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anthony. It was a great presentation. I took a lot of notes here. <laughs> And uh, well, uh, I don't know if uh, Antonio would you like to start or shall I? No, no, I think uh, you should start first. Okay. So more, okay. You're more the structuralist of the two of us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, I. Even Antonio's initial remarks, I think it's safer for you to start. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it, I was I was actually thinking about Lenny <laughs> when uh <-huh. laughs> during Anthony's presentation because uh, it's interesting to see this. Uh, this concept of unevenness, which is uh, which is essentially present in so many historical experiences, uh, uh, I would say that uh, most of uh, of the so-called emergent countries or mm -hmm. the latecomers in the in the global south, 
Singapore, uh, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, and and China, obviously. Uh, but China is a different, is an entirely different uh, mm -hmm. social and uh, economic system. Uh, but but these countries, uh, they are more the exception than the rule in terms of countries which managed uh, not to be stuck in the middle income trap or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. moving out of it. Um, and then I was, uh, well, first, uh, uh, I didn't know you, you had this contact with uh, Furtado, but when I read the chapter on compressed capitalism, I immediately remem uh, remembered Furtado and also the, the Latin American structuralists mm -hmm. because sure. the, the idea of dual economy and structural heterogeneity is, is very present. Yes. But I think uh, one thing which is more interesting in, in your approach, and uh, in this sense, it made me remember the classicals like uh, uh, the development of capitalism in Russia by Lenin and uh, uh -huh. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg and these right. uh, uh, Trotsky uh, is, is precisely this this idea of a combined uneven yes. development, mm -hmm. right? Which is not exactly very clear in the in in, in the contributions from uh, structural uh, uh, the, these structural school uh, from Latin America. Mm -hmm. um, but I was just thinking about. Uh, at the same time, what, what seems uh, uh, curious is that uh, you, you have this. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know if you agree with that, with this st statement that uh, we have no historical instances of unevenness in, in, in the capitalist uh, uh, development being overcome through spontaneous. Uh, capitalist development or with a uh, uh, so in in this sense uh at the same time india had a very uh positive developmental experience after its independence mm -hmm. uh although it didn't it wasn't enough the same way it wasn't enough in mexico it wasn't enough in brazil and it, it wasn't enough in Argentina because all of these three countries, they uh, different degrees, but essentially, especially Mexico and Brazil uh, as well, uh, uh, large of small, the PCP uh, mm -hmm. sector, the informal right. sector. Um, so um, my, my question would be in this uh, uh, when you have this this background, uh, do you think that uh, because there is a recent discussion on on the role of domestic markets for these large emerging countries and frugal innovation, uh, <clears throat> do you see that uh, these conditions could uh, really contribute to to eventually overcome and compress the capitalism? Or it's just, uh, it's more of a false hope like the ISI period, which also promised a lot of things uh, mm -hmm, uh, which mm -hmm. didn't take place. Uh, this is one question. And um, another question is, um, it has to do with, uh, uh, with something which is, uh, I, I don't know if you, if you agree with that um, when you consider Piketty's contribution uh -huh. on the decoupling between rent and economic growth mm -hmm. and when you think about this ISI period in India and other places around the world this decoupling was not something uh, so present in the economy actually it didn't exist it was more of a fortist uh, and then with this decoupling, it seems that compressed capitalism uh, is, no, is no big deal for business uh, at the moment. Mm -hmm. So uh, differently from other uh, situations where business had a strong incentive uh, to industrialize or to transform the economy because effectively 
driven or not driven by the state, but they were getting. So uh, my 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 second question is, uh, what about business in this compressed capitalism? Is there any possibility of uh, uh, having a greater interest in in getting out of this kind of a trajectory or or not? Uh, well, and uh, uh, just a, a very brief comment. It's on the, the economic, um, uh, the, the, the agrarian issue, which is, um, which is very much the same. There has been a discussion about Latin America, uh, the problems of Latin American industrialization due to uh, agrarian concentration and the lack of an agrarian reform and all this stuff. And recently, uh, it seems that many Brazilian scholars, they concentrated too much on the issues of rural development, local development, and they have forgotten, uh, sort of forgotten uh, the, the, the agrarian issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, for me, it's, it's very interesting to update this debate because it's not a water uh, under the bridge. Right. Uh, I, I think uh, not only because uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, productivity issues and the, 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 the cost is of the cost of food and reproduction all, but also because these agrarian elites, they are extremely powerful, politically speaking. Yes. And they are very intertwined with uh, uh, neoliberal financial capital. No, no, right. Yeah. yeah. So this is okay. Th these are my comments, and now okay. I. Uh, to okay, um, let me take the first uh, sort of question about, uh, let's say, whether, uh, you know, this frugal innovation uh, is very similar to the kind of false hopes that, let's say, the ISI might have raised in the past. Now, the, 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 the thing with ISI, and, and this is something uh, uh, I am uh, quite uh, uh, um, sort of uh, conscious of, is that even though the ISI uh, program in India didn't quite produce the type of expectations that were there, nevertheless, I think sowed the seeds of many of the strengths that we see today uh, in various sectors. So I'll give you just one, one example. Uh, which of course I have st you know, studied in great depth is the Indian IT sector. Now you don't think of the ISI program to be connected to the IT sector because number one, they are so far you know, apart in terms of, of, of time. Uh, the ISI was largely in the 1960s, uh, to some extent continued in the 1970s, but then it became started showing signs of exhaustion. Uh, the IT sector emerged sometime in the late 1980s, uh, and then maybe perhaps early 1990s. But they, what the state did, and unwittingly, in other words, obviously they didn't know that the IT industry was to, to target the future, although there was some movement in the electronics uh, sort of uh, industry. Uh, what the government of course did was to establish a higher education system. You know, a very good quality, elitist almost, but public, higher education system in the technology and, and science, uh, science sort of areas. These institutions became the sort of hub of creating quote unquote, you know, technical professionals or, or, or scientific personnel, which then of course, in the absence of, you know, uh, corresponding jobs during the time, what they did of course, was to do all kinds of other things. And then once the IT sort of industry emerged, uh, there was already, as part of ISI program, the Indian government also tried to promote the hardware sector, but again, with very limited success. Hardware sector, a lot of these people then became the source of the professional talent that we see. And then, of course, over time, this has been reinforced as the demand for such people you know, grew in, at the global level. And so then these institutions became the suppliers. And then there was a demonstration effect. There were many private you know, technical colleges that emerged. And so as a whole, this, this pathway, and in fact, this is why I say that you, know, you can't ignore the past in some ways because mm -hmm. the past actually has a bearing 
on the future. And this is one way by which we can make this connection where a completely new sector emerged in India, partly you know, accidental and very much so externally uh, driven, but India, I think, found a way to, found a window, I would say, of opportunity, mainly because the stream of uh, creating technical professionals has been created by the state during the ISI period. So this, I think, is, is one interesting sort of a phenomenon that I want to uh, talk about. Now, when it comes to frugal innovation and, and such things, I agree with you in the sense that I am not particularly hopeful because if you look at global capitalism, I mean, yes, uh, global capitalism accommodates small players, no doubt. And, you know, even, even your petty commodity producers, many of them would be part of the value chain somewhere along the line. Uh, producing some small thing here and there, but they are not transformative. I mean, I, I think this is the thing. So if you go back to the structural transformation problem, I don't think that these types of activities, they, they, they make you feel good, but they are not transformative. I, I, I guess that's what I want to say. So this small scale approach, frugal engineering, these things would work in a local context, no doubt. But when it comes to the global context, in, in, in the sense global capitalism, they just do not stand much chance in terms of presenting their products in the world market. So domestically, yes. In fact, there are lots of products and services that are locally produced and locally consumed. In fact, the petty commodity producers produce a lot of things that are consumed by the petty commodity producers themselves. They don't enter some other kind of market, all right? So from that point of view, I don't think that, you know, so in some ways, actually, frugal innovation and all of those things will continue to then reinforce this nature of compressed capitalism, because you will have the coexistence of both mm -hmm. advanced technologies, but also these alternative forms of, you know, making things uh, or, you know, uh, or, 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 uh, or alternative types of products. So in some ways, I think they, they sort of, coexist. And, and this is the nature of capitalism, because it does not look like that one is completely displacing the other. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and so this is where I think the, the nature of capitalism, because in the, in the West, even though, as I said, I, I have probably reduced it, uh, but given the fact that in the West, we're talking, let's say we're talking about 200 year sort of trajectory for the earlier sort of industrializing countries outside of Japan, let's say. Japan is more like 100 years, let's say. But a lot of the past, Japan is a slightly different case, but a lot of the things in the West, particularly in Europe, in North America, what you find is that the, the past has been erased almost completely. There is, there's, no, there's no real sort of hangover, so to speak, like in petty commodity producers and you know that sort of thing. They disappeared, in fact, uh, I, I had come across a statistic that in the earlier part of the uh, uh, 20th century, I think the so-called you know, small producers or petty commodity producers in the US was, had already fallen to less than 10%. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they were basically on their way out. But in, in, the, in the global South, you know, it's there everywhere. You know, it's, 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 it's present. It doesn't seem to go away, even if Brazilian capitalists, Indian capitalists are making their global presence felt mm -hmm. and they're exporting and exactly. they're you know, good at certain things, very competitive and, and so on. So that's one thing I want to say. The other is that this uh, ISI also must be seen as a form of state mandated rent seeking activity. Uh, rent seeking activity, it's state mandated because the state also is encouraging through this kind of industrialization, what we would call, and what I was calling in, in, in the other context, primitive accumulation. In other words, to generate capital by giving special privileges uh, to these businesses uh, through licensing and whatever else, and certain type of protection, obviously, whereby they could generate wealth to jumpstart a capitalist economy, right? So it is a rent-seeking kind of uh, activity when it comes to uh, ISI, uh, because it, it, and it is state mandated. So it's not like, you know, I mean, yes, there were some illegal things going on as well, underhanded things going on as well, but basically the state is saying, no, okay, we, we give you license, you make this thing, you have room to make money. The idea being is to incubate 
And of course, mm-hmm. this is what the state does is to incubate capitalists in the process of catch up, right? So this is what the state is sort of uh, 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 trying to do. So this, I think, is the, 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 the way to think about ISI. In other words, in, in some ways, ISI, <laughs> I mean, aside from the fact that there, there was a, it was a political response to the, the structural sort of domination of these economies and somehow to change that structure by industrializing yourself and to substitute for imports, uh, but it was also to create capitalists. Uh, in the process. The idea was to create sort of capitalists by giving them certain room or space to create wealth uh, for themselves. Uh, but of course, you know, they, 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 you know, it backfired in many, many ways. It didn't quite go as far as it should. But also the fact remains that ISI took place in, in context whereby, you know, there was a lot of people looking for work and ISI was very capital intensive and the usual problems mm-hmm. that arose uh, with uh, ISI. So I don't know if that sort of addresses some of the, the, the issues that uh, uh, you, you raised, although maybe not in a very sort of direct sort of way. When it comes to the, 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 the Piketty, you know, you say the, the decoupling of, of, of uh, rent and economic growth. Now, I mean, yes, Piketty, I mean, basically what he's saying is that if you have wealth, the return on wealth is greater than your economic growth. Right. Mm-hmm. In, so in some ways, then, uh, you know, the uh, people who are already wealthy is likely to experience even more wealth. I mean, that's basically the dynamic, even if the growth rate is high, but the return to wealth is greater than returns to the economy. Let's put it that. I mean, that's basically mm-hmm. his simple sort of way of looking at the, the dynamic. All right. Mm-hmm. So in this case, of course, and therefore, I think in some ways, uh, having the wealthy, whether in Brazil, Mexico, or, or India, the rise of the wealthy, it should not come as a surprise. But what should, of course, also come as a, not so much as a surprise, but what should we, we should account for is also the fact that the state has deregulated the environment, mm-hmm. economic environment. So when it has deregulated, it gives capital even more space to basically conduct their affairs and to enrich their wealth in diverse sort of ways. So in other words, they will undertake the investments, they will enlarge their markets by focusing on you know, foreign markets. And in some cases, including in India, certain businesses actually, even today, have given certain types of protection, political protection. So in other words, the state is actually choosing capitalists in, in India in some ways and promoting them. So for example, this uh, Ambani family, which is, I don't know if you're aware of it. I mean, they're the, you know, there are these two brothers, but one brother is more successful and they inherited a business uh, uh, from their father who was an interesting character himself in the sense, very austere man and, and all of that, but very sort of smart in the sense that he was very much involved in backward integration over time. And he created the world's largest petrochemical complex uh, in India, mm-hmm. right? But he started off as a trader in synthetic yarn, right? Huh. So this is this very sort of gradual backward integration. Then the sons inherited the business. Of course, they are now diversified into telecommunications and so on. But the government is actually you know, favoring uh, this particular uh, family business. What the agenda is, I don't know, but maybe too it is to it is a political sort of project than anything else, mm-hmm. uh, for, as far as the government is concerned. But they are very very wealthy, and their wealth has expanded, uh, you know, without question, uh, uh, you know, and they are diversifying, and they have the room to do that. You know, words, the space is there, the government is making space. So this increase in wealth must also be seen in that quote unquote neoliberal context. In other words, the regulations have disappeared. And these regulations are not just domestically, but globally speaking. Mm-hmm. You know, capital is deployed now globally. And even these guys, although they are still very domestically oriented, but you know, they have pretty much captured the Indian market and the Indian market is not that small. So businesses then will become wealthy, those who are already wealthy. And that's basically what I think uh, Piketty is, is basically saying. So if you have growth, then obviously the wealth will increase even more. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so this 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 decoupling so to speak is actually it's only uh, decoupling in the sense that uh, the, the 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 wealthy will continue as long as they have the room to deploy their wealth even more mm-hmm. um, and if if there is economic growth which we expect in many countries including india their wealth will also increase even further so in other words it will reinforce it in fact uh so that is i think what we can expect so now the coming to that last question that you had you know so do businesses care in this type of a you know compressed capitalist situation no i don't think the businesses care they to them their their goal is essentially to as long as they are able to reproduce themselves on on an expanding scale mm-hmm. they really don't care as to the what other things they don't have any social project per se yeah they may have some philanthropic foundation arm mm-hmm. here and there but those are you know i mean those are more publicity stunts than anything else so they of course will continue now the the only thing is that if there is a threat to their accumulation uh, process politically speaking let's say and I, i don't see it in the in the immediate future in india certainly not in india but you know there are there, you know you can have noise noises noises coming from here and there especially when it comes to issues of inequality although it still quite hasn't captured the imagination in india because india in many ways socially speaking is almost you know by definition <laughs> unequal <laughs> it's, it's 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 ingrained in that social system that people know what their position is in society you know that kind mm-hmm. of thing so therefore but it can still backfire in the sense that if the impoverishment which of course uh, you know i have pointed out in in my one of my recent papers uh, that the impoverishment in the context of this huge uh, uh, amassing of wealth if this becomes a a a, a political sort of problem then i think obviously there will be some movement in the way by which perhaps businesses will may want to uh somewhat sort of dilute their presence in some you know big sort of way in other words maybe maybe more transfers uh you know to uh, uh to the poor and or to the marginalized populations uh, already the indian government actually has a mandatory corporate social responsibility program for the mm-hmm. organized uh, businesses in other words they have to contribute some 1% of their revenues or some such thing now what what it is being used for i i have no idea how the corporations are using it obviously you know they may actually on paper spend 1% but what they are using it for i don't know and what the outcome of that is also i don't know but but these are not the ways by which you transform you know mm-hmm. structurally transform economies i mean the structurally transform like i said you need to get that agricultural sector going somehow you know we are mm-hmm. talking about 50% of the people workforce in agriculture i mean that's what is really the important dimension if that is not addressed we are still going to have this kind of capitalist trajectory which is a kind of a blend of this you know you know small scale a few large scale enclave you know dual persistence mm-hmm. of the petty commodity sector and so mm-hmm. okay thank you uh, antonio you have to unmute antonio yes, okay yes. Now well first of all let uh, let antonio breathe a little bit <laughs> and uh, first i want to thank you for the magisterial tour de force that you provided us knowing a, a lot of a lot of food for thought and a lot of challenges <laughs> a lot of intriguing questions and topics you know for us to discuss and also i think the purpose of this series is to help us brazilian to first you know to think more comparative but also help as we think brazil as you see others and i think we did a great job in terms of raising questions and issues which are extremely relevant for us you know and uh, we haven't thought about it you know at least made us we think then in, in the face of the indian uh, of the indian context and indian evolution and i think it was very nice also that the way you you set up your talk you know in terms of recovering you know, some of your previous series and you're very skillful in terms of saying that you're not going to talk about agents but that's all, everything you did is talking about agents all the time mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> in the sense that you said you got to do a structural a structural presentation but there's a lot of agents there so <laughs> Right. So that was very good. 
So let me let me make a couple of comments and I'll have a one big question in a way, uh -huh. which which I hope you will address in all your main team, which which is Landon. But a, a, a sort of small comments and uh, questions. I don't want to address the small questions. I just wanted to like to address my final question. But uh, one has to do with the uh, with the whole issue of compression. That you talk about compression as a concept, and then you go back and say that was not such a new concept. You know, and you talk about we talk how you thought it was a neat sequence. In fact, it was never it was never a neat sequence as well. No, I mean, Gershon Crown shows that. It was very a lot of blood, sweat, and tears for the, all the early developers and early industrializers. No, so we have to in a way to demystify that, and also we can have a more even comparison with the past too. Mm -hmm. I think the the contextual comparison is very good, but we also have to demystify the past as something that there was neat, it was never neat. You know, and I think Ocean Khan and a series of historical scholars in over the last fifty years have shown us that. And you have to kind of stop you know demystifying that. And and I think you're, you're right in, in talking about the timing, but. Uh, when you talk about timing, I mean, uh, as you said, uh, the context is changing all the time and what, what's the right time, you know? Because I mean, uh, a lot of in Latin America we discuss, oh, the time is not very good. You know, Furtado talked about the terms of trade, but at the same time you saw how the Asian countries now taking off you know, at, the, at the worst time. So what's a good time for one can be the bad time for the other. So we have to be careful about when you, when you bring some of the timing uh, argument into, into the picture now. In relation to the one other point is relation to the fragmented state and you know, being captured. If I understood well your argument, of the capture then you 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 gave us more information about you know in the in the sense that the land reform is lo no longer on the political agenda, and so the capture state by the rural elites. I think, so I understood you know the capture for you is uh, has to do with the rural elites you now because there's no land reform, which is of course is a cherished you know, topic in you know about the whole south and Southeast Asian you know, development or you know, mean mean. Uh, Moises was just advising a, a thesis on South Korea, and I've been reading a lot about South Korean land reform, mm -hmm. where a lot of the debate you know, hinders on exactly what you just said. Oh, but there the argument is a little different. Is that okay? Is the political argument, and that's also done or not have done about Thailand and the Philippines, where the rural is more closer to our argument. But also there's an older argument, which I think is the one you're trying to address. At the same time, it has like the older argument by Gershon Kron, the commercialization of agriculture, if I understood it well. So like to, there is the, the, the political argument, the land elites know they, they don't exist anymore, so they don't capture the state. If they think, whereas in, the, in India, no, they continue to exist, so they capture the Indian state. I know I it's still not clear to me what it did to the state. I mean, what you talk, which period are we talking about there? I mean, what, when, when did the capture occur and it has been lasting up today? What, how did it affect, affect the ISI? What did it affect the there? No. So I think it's, it, we need a more precision in that. Uh, in, in trying to understand what, how does it affect you know, the current state and the future state of India. You know? And I think the issue that you're trying to address, and I think you, you made it clear towards the end, is more the commercialization of agriculture. It's the old team of Gershon Kron. I mean, countries are not developing, they don't commercialize agriculture, and if you don't uh, generate the incomes, you know, so we can finance, you know, finance industrialization. And that uh, is also something that's a, a, a very uh, large team in Brazil, and I'm going to come back to that in a, in a minute. Um, Another point, you know, is just uh, my gripe with some uh, some uh, some local stru structuralists in Brazil. You know, when you talk about uh, about the latest uh, modernization mantra, getting the state capacities right, you know, kind of people throw now the big problem nowadays: states don't have capacities, which I think is a lot of bullshit. Part of my French, because uh, that that begs the question: what the states can learn? You know, because okay, if what you've been doing for 30, 50 years is right, it's just a question of implementation capacity. You know, then there's a serious problem about what you're talking about learning here. And then also begs your question that you said, the context has been changing, the state has to change, you know, and then how the state, you know, the response you had for 50 years was not, a, it was just an issue of implementation. It's not gonna solve the problem nowadays, sorry. So I think there's a dissonance there, you know, and I think that we are just bringing up the theme that you, you kind of you just threw that, but I, it's not really the, the trust of your talk, and I know that. Um, and then I was thinking, you know, when you're talking, uh, when you talk about the dispossession, or if in fact, you know, when you talk about the dispossession of the, of the, of the, of the people in the land, you know, if that's not the true compression, it's more like an endogenous compression, because you see, that's the, that's the real constraint, you know, you're talking about compressed, but in fact, you're talking about constraints, you know, structural constraints, in a way to put it, though. Uh, in fact, but the way you, you construct and you, you beautifully showed us, you know, that uh, the issue of land, you know, is what's really, you know, holding back India, if I understood well. So that's the real endogenous constraint for India, you know, 
develop in a, in a more consistent and a more neat way, you know, at least in trying to reimagine this neat way of the past, of uh, beautifying the past, you know. And that, it, perhaps that will be the, the real component of capitalism, you know. And also in relation to when you talk about uh, how the distributional effects of uh, the previous no policy of redistribution in, in India, you know, and that applies to Brazil, and I think it's very interesting, that's one area we probably need to collaborate and think more together. <laughs> To what extent, you know, the leapfrog is not going to be a technological one, but your leapfrog is going to leapfrog the welfare state into a transfer state, which I think that's what's happening in India, what's happening in Brazil, and in several other emerging countries now, particularly in Latin America. Now, that's, uh, I mean, I think the welfare state is gone for us. <laughs> we're going to be transfer states. That, we're going to leapfrog that. So we have to think, you know, in that sense. Um, and, uh, and also like to hear a little bit more, you didn't really talk about much about it, but I know you've done work on that, about the role of, uh, of a professional immigrants, you know, because uh, to what extent you, that's more like a side question, to what extent you think of this professional immigrants and uh, uh, that you, you, you look at, you know, how they bring, you know, not only remittances, but also technology and, uh, and they bring in business, whether could they transfer, you no know, Indian economy, you know, or the, or the land is still the, the real, the real constraints, you know, they're gonna also, they only change the margins and the margins not gonna be big enough to change the country, which seemed like in your argument, but I wanted to see how you go there. And then finally, my, my big question about the, about the issue of the land, you know, I think it goes back to the issue of uh, commercialization of agriculture, because okay, in Brazil, okay, you still have the destitute, you have the dispossession, but Brazil in a way commercialized agriculture you know, to a large extent. And that, Okay, in more contemporary times, the last 20 years, Brazil become an agricultural power, blah, 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 blah. And that seems to be a, an exit for the Brazilian failure, failure industrialization and the deindustrialization. Uh, of course, you know, the, the agricultural reform at, at a national scale never happened in Brazil, but if the agriculture accumulation, or there's been very good uh, historical studies in Brazil, regional historical studies that show commercialization of agriculture occurring in very specific you know, regions and states like especially in the, in the state of Sao Paulo, which had this dual uh, 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 aspect of being a very, very agriculture and they become a very industrialized. And there was this, I thought there was no actual land reform there. <laughs> there was a transfer of wealth from the agriculture from the industrialization. That's a very good historical study like Maurice Font and others have shown that, I mean, this capital was critical for the Sao Paulo industrialization in a way leveraged the Brazilian industrialization, sketching in a very sketchy way. So I, I'm just wondering if in the case of India, no, I, I don't know much about India agriculture, much less India economy, as you can tell, <laughs> except for the IT sector, which I know a little bit. Uh, to, to a large extent where there are in India, there are like uh, regions or areas in India where you have this commercialization of agriculture has happened. Because I, I kind of hear, I read very sparse thing, you know, in, could the change you know, come from these peripheral regions or some of the regions that could like in a way irradiate to the rest of, to the rest of India or not? And is there a possibility there for this transformation coming from the land from a, from a very specific or a small set of these decentralized areas that then could uh, lead you know, to a transformation, a tra structural transformation of, uh, of the Indian economy? You know? In a related question has to do with, uh, which I wrote here, you know, can we talk, because you mentioned that a lot of the agricultural people nowadays know they, they still in the agriculture, but they like involved in transportation and uh, other activities. Now, can you also think another possibility for India? You'll be some sort of a decentralized rural, rural urbanization. I mean, it could be like a small, small industry emerging you know, in different areas, and then you're gonna have a transformation of the, of, uh, of the agriculture. I don't know, just raising possibilities, you know, and I like taking the opportunity to see you're an expert and, to hear from you there. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, just, I hope you just have a quick time question. For, for some uh, questions yeah, from the uh, public. Uh, uh, my question to Anthony: Could we pick up two questions from the from the floor? So the others, and, and then, or, uh, Anthony, you just you just answer whatever you feel like. Don't feel obliged to answer everything, and because of the time, you yeah, 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 sure, yeah, sure. Time. So just uh, it's more to to be a okay um, a debate. But let's keep pick. Pick a couple of questions for the audience, and then yeah. we'll, you answer the, okay. the last one. Okay, That's right. do you have any questions for the audience? I don't know, Bruno has Irina, left. Irina, or, Irina. Uh, Irina, Irina one. Yeah, I, I have a question, you know, I was thinking very well. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Okay, yes, yeah, just, just let's see if there is someone else. Uh, Bruno, would you like to have a question? 
Okay, so uh, Irina, Yarina, and Bruno. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, while we were thinking about you know this uh, uh, like delay uh, and the big uh, this agricultural sector is still in India and persistence, you know. So I was thinking, and you were discussing like economical means and structural changes. But it just what I observe, you know, back in Ukraine, also thinking about this um, uh, like uh, agricultural and uh, uh, traditional, let's call it sector, you know, there is a, like um, a resistance to capitalism in cultural meaning, you know, because people just value this uh, traditional style, style yeah. life mm -hmm. and you know, they perceive sure. capitalism like something that, you know, like takes meaning, meaning from things, you know, that this is, yeah, you can live like rich, maybe in a city, in a nice apartment, but you will lose something important, you know, existentially. Uh, so uh, this is cultural. So, so is it the factor in India, you know, this cultural uh, uh, resistance to cap capitalism mm -hmm. and how you can address this? Okay. All right. Br Bruno? Yes, well, th thank you very much for, for this uh, very stimulating uh, talk and um, for re um, re reminding how, how many aspects we have in common between the big um, economies in the global south and their fragile models of capitalism that um, are, are um, leading to these um, levels of concentration, of lack of participation and dif difficulties to, to, to create more um, integrated ways of upgrading and improvement. Mm -hmm. So I think there are so many, so many topics there um, that um, can, can be discussed. Well, let me just make like two, two, two three questions. One, one would be um, on, on, the, on the colonial heritage that we've been talking about in, in, uh, in, in the introduction. Um, and well, um, if you take, for example, the um, Asemoglu framework, mm -hmm. um, um, which, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I've been like critical about it, but um, I would like to know your, your opinion, any opinion um, in the sense that there we have, um, in, the, in the case of India, we would have another um, uh, uh, example with, of a country with, with British colonial heritage. So what's, what's the role of this um, uh, um, institutional background created from the, 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 the British colonial system? Um, because of course it's, it's diverging from Asimoglu's conclusions that um, British uh, regimes would lead to um, uh, 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 um, a, a more adequate application of capitalist institutions and building a framework for for that it's 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 I mean it's a, it's a very this dichotomy is not it's not working in many senses but still I would like to know your opinion about um, the, the 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 British uh, herit heritage of uh, these institutional structures. Uh, my second question would be about um, levels of analysis. I think. Um, um, it's very difficult um, to maintain um, uh, the, the influence of national level models. This, there's been this uh, critics, critique also on like methodological, methodological nationalism. And I think in the case of India, this, this is something that's maybe very, very much present because of the, the size, the complexity, and the, 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 the big diversity in cultural terms. And so can we really talk about India in that sense when we talk about these topics or what, what would be possible? I mean, nation, national policies and uh, uh, efforts to build models are of course still important, but they're also very, in, in a sense, limited. But what, what would be your, your um, take on that? Okay, and and the last la one last point would be just quickly. I don't know if it's this time. Um, there's of course now this discussion about the the um, 
uh, 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 agrarian reforms in India that's been uh, uh, that collapsed, uh, that uh, they, they take back. Could you just briefly? <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know, I, I was going to use that to address uh, uh, Antonio's question on, on the land okay. issue. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Um, uh, okay. So let me uh, take uh, this one question from uh, Antonio. Uh, on the, the commercialization of agriculture. Let's just sort of start with that. This, this was your, toward the end, you know, I mean, uh, there were many obviously other questions, but let me start with that one. The, the, the commercialization of, of agriculture. So, uh, and then this will also in some ways address Bruno's last uh, comment on, on, on this uh, question about agriculture. The thing is that, uh, uh, there is, of course, uh, in India, uh, different states in different regions of the country that have specialized in certain types of commercial crops. So, for example, you know, uh, you know, just like Brazil, India has a lot of sugarcane, right? Uh, and, and but but Brazil, of course, the sugarcane is being used for something industrial purpose as well. Whereas in India, you know, Indians have a very sweet tooth. They eat a lot of sweets. <laughs> so sugar is a very, very big part of, of, of the crop. But there are certain regions where, you know, there are cooperatives, large scale cooperatives that have organized themselves, uh, especially in the state of say, Maharashtra, which is the, one of the wealthier, wealthier states in, in the West. Uh, you know, they, they have cash crops, what we call cash crops. There has been a diversification of Indian agriculture away from subsistent types of production for those uh, uh, households uh, that have a little bit more capital, uh, perhaps a little bit larger sort of land that they have. And so they have diversified into what we call the cash crop, such as, you know, vegetables actually is considered to be a cash crop as opposed to grains, let's say, right? So whether it's vegetables or fruits, you know, in fact, uh, uh, India is, you know, beginning to export grapes and strawberries, which is unheard of. Uh, in, in Europe, I used to find, you know, in, in Denmark, I used to find, you know, grapes from India. Uh, so, which I you know, I never see, seen those things before, but <laughs> but this is obviously part of that process whereby there is a certain kind of diversification among the slightly better off of farmers uh, who can now diversify into these cash crops, and there is you know some kind of a value chain there. Obviously, somebody is organizing it, but the commercialization of agriculture uh, has been an attempt by this government. Uh, and, and there are some actually well-meaning, let me say, agricultural economists who have been saying this, that somehow India has to produce agricultural output on a larger scale. I mean, that's basically what they're talking about. So in other words, go the capitalist way in terms of scale, when it comes to scale. This is the attempt that has, that has been trying, they have been trying to introduce for a long time. But farmers do not obviously find th that kind of incentive strong enough to go in. Those who have the land, those who have the resources or capital, uh, you know, then they can and they are beginning to make, uh, you, know, uh, you know, larger scale operations. But Indian farms on the average are very small. I mean, that's the one thing is they're very, very small. The government has been trying to do it in this, this over this past one year, the government, and of course, this is where the, the, the unsmartness of the government shows up because they try to simply ram it down the farmer's throats by trying to introduce so-called these reforms, agricultural reforms. And the idea was that they would do away with uh, so-called middlemen. Now, in, the way Indian agriculture works is that there is a wholesale market, all the farmers take it to that wholesale market, and then you know, the, there's an intermediary or middle, middle sort of broker, if you will, who then sort of buy it off and then sell it off in other retail kind of markets. And what the government was trying to sort of convince the farmers that, well, we'll eliminate this uh, middle, middleman and you can sell it directly to whoever you want, they're telling the farmers that is, uh, and thereby obviously increase the incomes uh, more for the uh, direct sellers. That was one. The other, of course, is that, and it was quite unclear, and this is where I think the farmers got really mad, was that, you know, India has a minimum support price, MSP, it's known as MSP, for the, for the output of the, of the grain. So, which means that 
the farmers are guaranteed a certain price. And this set of reforms indicated, although it didn't quite explicitly say so, that somehow the MSP will be removed. And this is what pissed off all the farmers. Uh, they were really mad at this. And, and, and that's why they protested over more than a year. And then finally the government relented. And of course, telling them that, well, no, the MSP will not be removed, but the farmers won't, will not believe unless they see something in writing. So this idea of commercialization of agriculture has been going on for quite, uh, quite some time, but it is already in any case taking place. So I'll give you one other example. So I talked about Reliance, the Ambani family, which is one of the wealthiest families. One of the other things that they have done is that they have branched into uh, 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 basically grocery stores, large scale grocery stores. Now, as you know, in India, most of the basic grocery items are sold through small enterprises. They are neighborhood stores, you know, owned by a family or individual or whatever. Very small sort of volumes of it. So this large idea of large scale retail, of course, Brazil I know has large scale retail for a long, long time. In India, that was largely absent, although now we are beginning to see the presence of that. Walmart tried to enter India, but could not. Okay, so it was very difficult for Walmart. So, but Reliance, on the other hand, was able to, and as I said, the government gives it a little bit more space, you know. Mm. So, <laughs> so Reliance was able, uh, does open this. Now, the thing is that what this means, is especially let's say when it comes to farm products, uh, it means then that the production of a farm output has to be done also on a larger scale. So, which means that the idea of contract farming has in India. So, in other words, you know, there will be large scale producers who will be contracted out to produce X amount of this or that, you know, and of course, the idea of standardization. Because if the output of, comes from small farms, the output is very heterogeneous. It's not, the cauliflower does not look the same from every farm, right? But when you're selling it in a big grocery store, you want to have standardization. And so this kind of standardization means also that there's certain has to, there has to be certain controls in place and certain kind of mechanisms in place that will allow for large volume of output with a very standardized kind of output. This is the kind of pressure that many sort of, uh, uh, basically the agricultural sector is facing, but not everybody is in a position to undertake this, but there are entrepreneurial types of farmers who are able to do it. So the process of commercialization has already begun and the pressure to commercialization has al already been present, but obviously there are you know, other ways by which uh, it's happening, uh, you know, in fact, one would say it's happening by stealth. In other words, you know, <laughs> whether whatever else is going on here, the, the big businesses are already organizing agriculture in a certain kind of way. Now, to what extent, of course, this will have a transforming impact in terms of commercialization of agriculture is yet to be seen, because I doubt that it will commercialize Indian agriculture as a whole. It will commercialize certain parts of it, uh, certain areas of the country, especially those areas that have better land holding sort of sizes and more entrepreneurial type of farmers. They will obviously, if they find it profitable, they will get into it. But since we have about 50% of people tied to the agricultural sector, in fact, most of them will not be able to participate in this kind of uh, development. So that's where I would put the, the, the nature of uh, commercialization uh, of agriculture. Uh, but the pressure is there and we, we will see some movement in that direction, uh, but obviously not to the extent that Indian agriculture will become commercialized. In fact, Indian agriculture will remain small hold, holding based uh, type of uh, agriculture. Okay. Uh, I, I hope that sort of addresses uh, somewhat uh, the, the, the questions that you had about um, uh, agriculture. Um, uh, Antonio is correct, and, and a related issue there, and Antonio is correct that this disposition is an endogenous constraint. In other words, you know, uh, you, know how, uh, you need to dispossess. So in other words, primitive accumulation is a necessary condition for 
<laughs> capital is development. I mean, we know, at least historically, we know that. I mean, it is a necessary condition. The debate going on. <laughs> but yes, it's been, but the thing is that, yes, but the thing is that in, in places like India or late industrialization, this is, an, this is not a process that is going on. In the sense that it is an ongoing process with, you know, so for example, again, that's that notion that somehow you have to at least look after the people who are left out in many ways is postponing primitive accumulation because you're not allowing them to be dispossessed. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, one must also understand that, as I said, that India is a very politicized society. So Indians have come to recognize their rights very, very strongly. In fact, there was the right, rightist turn, not in the political right wing turn mm -hmm. kind of thing, yeah. but a rightist turn in the sense that people began to demand certain rights, all kinds of rights, information rights, education rights, you know, uh, political, all kinds of political rights and so on and so forth. These rights, there was actually a moment in Indian uh, recent political, political history is that there was a rightist turn in Indian society whereby the state began to accommodate all these demands from the civic uh, civil society uh, in terms of rights, right? So given that consciousness, that means that the Indian government cannot be completely indifferent, uh, even if it has the power to do so, but it cannot be completely indifferent from the, 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 the kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, elements of those uh, society, uh, elements of the society that are being completely left out. It cannot be. So it has to do uh, something uh, for them. So this dispossession then is, in some ways, a, a real dilemma. Dilemma in the Indian uh, you know, capitalist trajectory, because on the one hand, you need it, but on the other hand, you can't completely have it. Uh, but it's still taking place, because as land becomes more valuable, as, as, as land becomes valuable because of its non-agricultural use, and as growth takes place, which means incomes arising for a certain class of people, uh, and cities are also, I mean, you know, cities are already huge. I mean, they, they have to expand outward, you know. I mean, yes, they're building upward, else, uh, no doubt, but obviously wealthy people like to have standalone house, you know, I mean, family, you know, single family owned standalone kind of a house, they need space. For all of those reasons, there are encroachments. And of course, whatever industrialization is taking place will also be encroaching on ultimately on agricultural land. In fact, there is actually a land uh, acquisition kind of an act, uh, which this Indian, which this particular government tried to actually uh, make it even more uh, difficult uh, for farmers to uh, 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 not to be able to sell their land. Uh, but there are limits to what can be done. So, and this is part of the whole rightist, right, rights-based movement, whereby acquisition in itself is limited. In fact, you have to pay three, four times the market price in order to get land, if it's going to be used for non-agricultural purposes. So these, these are political pressures, which then in many ways limit dispossession, even though farmers, if they find the prices attractive enough, they will sell. Uh, many farmers would sell, but not all of them, because again, the only asset that they have is land. They don't have any other asset. So this is a very peculiar sort of situation whereby the, the, it's, it's neither here nor kind of there, but the disposition process is again, a very slow, but ongoing process, very slow ongoing process. So in other words, primitive accumulation from that point of view is really very, very slow. And who knows, it may never completely take place. So that's pretty much what I would uh, like to uh, sort of say uh, regarding the land question and the commercialization uh, of, uh, of agriculture. Um, to quickly uh, address uh, Yarina's question about cultural factors, Yes, it is, a, it is a factor, but not in the way uh, uh, that somehow it impedes, uh, let's say, the adoption of technologies or that sort of thing. In other words, in fact, uh, at least in the Indian case, most of the uh, surveys or the data uh, regarding agriculture pretty much indicates that nobody really wants to farm, <laughs> all right? Nobody wants to farm. If they can, if they can get out, they will get out, but they cannot get out. That's that's the difficulty, right? So in that sense, I don't think it's a 
it's an activity they value. Now, there might be individuals who may have a lot of land and they enjoy, you know, a certain kind of, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, rural, sort of rural, but comfortable existence. That's sl slightly different. Uh, but for most people, it is not an option. In fact, the younger generation is, in fact, that's where some of that migration comes in. That is where also the non-farm type of uh, employment in the countryside also comes about because it's the young people who are educated, a little bit more better educated, who then take up non-farming occup occupations. Mm -hmm. So this is another kind of social change that we are, uh, 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 we are witnessing. So nobody knows. So in that sense, no, they do not want to be actually uh, in farming. <clears throat> to come to Bruno's question about the colonial uh, uh, heritage, yes, Ache Moglu and, and Robinson, you know, <coughs> they have a, a very, uh, again, a very neat and clean understanding of institutions. In other words, there's only one kind of one set of institutions that basically work and, you know, and, and that's what everybody should try to sort of emulate. OK, so obviously that's a problem because, again, institutions are, you know, creatures of society and history. They just don't, you know, yes, you can shape them. You can engineer some of them. But over the overall package, the institutional package or bundle that comes with it is not something that you can easily sort of uh, shape. Now, the, the interesting thing with the British colonial heritage, of course, is that, yes, Britain did uh, institute certain types of, okay, politically speaking, a very kind of a liberal sentiment, let's put it this way. Uh, it, it, more of the enlightenment kind of thing, although when they were jailing people, the, the enlightenment part was quite the, the, the picture. Uh, but the point is that, yes, they did sort of endow India with it. But also, more importantly, and, and to go back a little bit further, is the, the, the British created a tax collecting mechanism in the countryside. In other words, increasing revenues. One must understand that the British government in India was self-financing, which means all the money that was needed to run India by Britain was raised in India, all right? So in other words, money did not come from London to rule India. The money to rule India came from India itself. So one of the things that the British cleverly did was they relied on an existing system, tax collection system, which was basically under the Mughals, the, you know, the previous sort of uh, uh, ruling, uh, you know, nobility that, pretty much ruled most of the country, not all of it, but most of it. They already had a very elaborate tax collecting mechanism. What the British did was that they simply relied on it, except that this time what they did was they, uh, um, they collected the taxes in advance from the tax collectors. Mm. So, which meant then, of course, the tax collectors would be pretty ruthless in getting the the taxes from the peasants or the, or, the, or the farmers. And of course, paying tax meant that they had to earn income in cash, which means then the process of commercialization of agriculture in a small way begins at that level. That is the introduction of taxes uh, in, the, in, the, in the countryside. And the British were trying to max maximize their revenues so that they could then run the government in India. So the British actually introduced a tax system using the existing system, uh, and then basically to contribute to the uh, sort of uh, commercialization of agriculture, because then they had to sell it in the market to earn, earn, earn basically cash. So this was one sort of aspect of, on the agricultural front. Of course, there are many other kinds of endowments that the British, of course, uh, gave to India, the language English being, uh, is, uh, being one of the, the, the principal sort of uh, endowments, but also the bureaucratic system, of course, excessively bureau bureaucratic system, which is, uh, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's often a, a, a problem in its own right. But I think that in some ways, yes, there were certain kinds of institutions, particularly in the area of so-called law and order. Law and order, and this law and order was devolved to the extent uh, at the sort of local levels which of course uh, on independence then the Indian government used this decentralized form of bureaucracy also for development purposes. So in other words, the, 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 the development project then get also got diffused to these local levels 
through these uh, administrative structures. So for example, in India, you have these units, administrative units uh, called uh, blocks. Uh, so you know, uh, 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 a, a certain region of a state may have several blocks and each block will have what is known as a BDO or a block development officer. So the block de development officer would be in charge of disbursing any kind of development funds that come from the state, from other levels of the state, and then to put it into you know, use in those sort of local areas. So in that sense, one might say that, yes, that, uh, that uh, you know, it, it was an inheritance of the British when it also comes to, uh, uh, you know, to development at that very sort of small local uh, kind of level. Um, yeah, so then I think that, yes, there are certain types of institutions, but I think they, the, 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 the problem, of course, is that there are many laws uh, uh, that still exist in the books today, and the Indian government uh, refuses to get rid of them because it serves its own purpose very well. So, for example, anything to do with terrorism or anti-national activities and so on, these are actually colonial laws. <laughs> and, and they want, and so this government is actually using those laws, uh, you know, to protect itself, uh, you know, and abusing it. In fact, one might say even abusing it. So there are obviously certain negative uh, aspects to it as as well. But I think the, the the most important contribution, I think, although there has been some erosion of it, is the the, the liberal democratic ideas in the Indian context, because one has to understand that. India, by definition, in terms of its social structure, is very illiberal. And yet, this imposition of a, of, of, of a foreign sort of system, parliamentary system, which, of course, the Indian elites at the time of independence really embraced it and internalized it to the point that, of course, India works on, on a constitutional federated kind of a system. Uh, even though today this particular government is often trying to, you know, find ways to, uh, you know, not sort of, you know, stick to adhere to some of these constitution, constitutional sort of uh, issues. Uh, but basically that I think is perhaps the most important uh, 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 element that the British have endowed uh, in India and the Indians have embraced, most Indians have embraced it and they are fully aware of their rights. So I think this is perhaps what might, and then of course, as Antonio uh, said, you know, leapfrogging into the welfare dimension, maybe this is the only hope that we have in, in the case of India where politically then it may, may continue to push the government in that sort of direction. I mean, there are many programs in India which no other country has. So for example, India actually has the world's largest employment program in the countryside. So in other words, anybody who wants to work uh, you know, manual, do manual work for 100 days a year will be guaranteed work for 100 days in the countryside, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the implementation is done by the different local states. So therefore, the results are not particularly even. Obviously, some states do a better job than others. But the government of India has this mandated federal program, which basically says you want to work 100 days a year, we'll give it to you. And what they do is, of course, you know, basically, you know, building rural roads, uh, digging trenches. So, in other words, it's 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 kind of a Keynesian type of a of an approach, uh, in the sense that you know you creating some certain kind of demand, or in this case, it's not so much demand, but it's really, you know, putting food uh, on the table kind of thing because these are obviously quite desperate people uh, who will do this uh, kind of work. But for some, it could be an offsetting, I mean, additional income in addition to what they're already doing because agriculture is very seasonal. So there are parts of the year when you're not really doing much. You know, you, 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 the planting season is over. You're waiting for the harvest season in between. What do you do? You know, you can go to the cities to find some work or take up this offer of from the from the government so these are some of the programs that actually already exist in india these are various types of welfare types of programs uh, which of course you know obviously need to be strengthened better implemented and so on but they are already there so obviously in 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 some sense then you know the question is you know will the future uh, given you know the kind of crisis that is 
plaguing the agricultural sector, uh, and of course, not enough jobs in the urban areas, and whatever jobs they are very sort of precarious types of jobs. Uh, you know, will 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 these types of developments push the public to expect more from the government in terms of trying to you know have a perhaps a more acceptable uh, standard of, of of living, right? So you know, so from that point of view, then I would say that you know the the, the British legacy is, I think where that positive aspect is this idea that you know you you are, you are an individual and you have certain rights that is being internalized very very strongly uh, in the uh, case of of india okay and then i will address one last question uh, and that is on the role of uh, uh, it uh, professionals this, of course, is, a, is, is, is perhaps the, one of the most visible and perhaps the, 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 the I would say, a very successful uh, sector. Uh, and, you know, I myself have written quite a bit, but there's a fair amount of literature uh, on this. The question, of course, is that, you know, what about the so-called diaspora? I mean, basically what we are referring to is the diaspora. That is the overseas Indians uh, working now. The first one correction I want to make, based on what uh, Antonio uh, said, and it's it's actually quite understandable uh, to say that uh, about remittance income. But I have to I have to say that these professionals are not the major sources of remittance income. No, no. <laughs> ah, the reason for that, of course, is that you know they are already coming from relatively well-off families. That is, you know, educated middle-class families. So therefore, sending money back home is not that sort of you know compelling. Yeah, as referring to the mirrors for the angels in the in the Middle East countries. Ah, exactly. That's where the the remittance income from. is from. Is mainly the working class people. Uh, they are the ones who are sending money, and of course, Middle East uh, or the Gulf countries are the major sources of, uh, of, of remittance income. Now, uh, the question of course, and, and the development literature also tries to address this question is what is the role of remittance income on development, right? So, I mean, yes, I mean, at the very sort of basic level, there is a, a positive sort of uh, impact because this extra income that comes in and uh, is, is it, it, it encourages families uh, in terms of their, you know, uh, you know savings, uh, savings rate, but also, con and then therefore contributes to children's, uh, better children's education. But also I think there is, is you know, and this, is, this has been visible in the state of Kerala where a lot of uh, migrants uh, from Kerala, you know, go to, uh, to the Gulf countries. In fact, I don't know if you've heard the saying that uh, Dubai is the best run Indian city. <laughs> No, never heard of it. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. There, there is an Indian character on, in the Squid Games from South Korea. Have you seen that? No, I have not. <laughs> yeah, it, it's an Netflix series. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's Are also you, uh, game a migrant. Huh? Are you talking about Squid Game? No. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Squid I Game. Yeah. Seen it yet? I know. I have not seen it yet. But uh, anyway, the point is that yes, there are a lot of uh, migrants, but these migrants are of course temporary workers, which means then they only go for a year or two on contract, but mm -hmm. they save whatever they can of their earnings, and then they repatriate it uh, back home. So there is a positive element to this, but I think some of the uh, well, I wouldn't say negative. I mean, it, it's, it's people do whatever they want to do with their money. It's their business. But a lot of big houses are, are created in these places where they stand out, you know, when the rest of the environment, but, but because they have this so-called, you know, petrodollars or whatever it is, that they have these big houses, uh, which, which in some ways is, a, is an unproductive investment, if you, if you ask me, from an economic development point of view. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, they are spending more money on their children's education, perhaps getting better health care and so on. So overall, yes, their standard of living has increased. Uh, Kerala is one of those states, I think, where you can see the impact of this uh, sort of remittance income. But uh, even though India receives the, the, the highest volume of remittance income, but it's still you know, small change when it comes to the economy as a whole. So in other mm -hmm. words, again, we don't expect the remittance income to be a major driver 
of economic development, except in those places where the money is fairly uh, uh, concentrated. Yes. But when it comes to the technical, the, the, the professionals, the it's, like, it's a very different kind of an impact. There is a major developmental impact in the sense that they actually have contributed to new businesses in India. Uh, in other words, uh, 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 not only existing uh, operations out of the US, let's say, have operations in India, and so a lot of exporting of services are taking place, high value services, uh, but also many Indians have elected to go back and basically start their own operations, which means that they become entrepreneurs and they grow their own business, and then they also start exporting. So from a Export revenue point of view, the IT industry has done very, very well. Uh, you know, it, it, it's very large. I mean, the IT industry does not employ more than maybe 3.5 million people or so, but they contribute, you know, over a hundred and some billion dollars worth yeah. of export revenues, right? Yeah, plus the pharmaceutical sector is a significant one. And the pharmaceutical sector is now beginning to do that, but that's because of the the generic markets that they have positioned themselves in, and of course, with some movement in also moving into you know, branded products. So in fact, I was taking my recent medications, uh, which is a bare product, uh, right? But then I saw it was made in India. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so yes, no, the US is a major market for Indian pharmaceutical uh, uh -huh. products for sure. So the thing is that, yes, there is a movement, this entrepreneurial movement. And in fact, uh, I read constantly in the business press about startups in India. And again, but these startups are all in this sort of information technology type. So for example, you know, this payment system, there's a company called Paytm, uh, Paytm, right? And, and, and it's, it's going on in for, a, for an IPO and, and the numbers are just mind boggling when they mm -hmm. go, you know, go for this initial public offering. Billions of dollars. I mean, it's like, you know, <laughs> what's the value of this thing? And yet, you know, public wants it. There's this, you know, demand for these types of operations. And the government is now beginning to encourage it uh, as well. So, the, again, so here's the thing. I mean, uh, it's not so much, I mean, yes, there are some established manufacturers, no doubt, but there are this, again, this whole new sector that is emerging, which is pretty much very information technology driven uh, type of mm -hmm. sectors mm -hmm. and a lot of new startups. But these lot of these startups have connections to the overseas sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, technical professionals technical. Uh, who, of course, encourage it, who influence it and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, Anthony, thanks a Great. thousand. I think we, you yeah. went to a marathon over two hours. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> All right. and I, and, uh, it was really, really great. Yeah, it was, we uh, was so fantastic. So and it was details. really exciting, very, yeah. very engaging. You know, I think, given the, the level of back and forth we had here, and also thank yeah. uh, Yarina and Steph. It's and uh, what? Small, but very qualified in the audience. Yes, thank you very <laughs> much very for that. faithful uh, for two hours here. <laughs> <laughs> you, what, know, you, what, know, you don't find too many uh, too many attendees uh, you know with so many zooms going around all over the place yeah yeah so that, that, but okay. at least uh, as we have broadcast uh, on the youtube over the youtube i think this is gonna and what strikes me most is is how you manage to move from such abstract uh, or not abstract but more general concept is like uh brodel uh wallerstein and also more uh, very micro level things like uh, firms, strategies, and sectors. Uh, that's really fantastic. fantastic. Yeah, it's really All right. impressive. Aula magna. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much again. And uh, let us stay in touch. I know uh, Antonia and Moises will have a, a few things to do. Yeah, we'll, we'll set up a. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's give you time to rest after this uh, webinar and get well, mm -hmm. and then we will set up a time. All right. Yeah. Oh, sounds good. Yeah. Very good. And thank you, uh, Bruno, for being there and uh, asking questions. I hope we will uh, meet again, if not on online, in you know somewhere. I mean, I'm planning yeah. to go to Paris next month, but let us see. I'm I'm monitoring uh, uh, the COVID situation. Uh, yes. Uh, and, yeah, and I, thank you yes, very much. I I participate in this. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of this group called Jerpisa, which is a uh, a French-based. Uh, the Rangers, yes. Uh, Jerpisa, they do the automobile industry. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
workers yeah, and, try, and, and try to establish a, a, a GRP's equivalent for the oil industry. Ah, okay. Mm. All right. Yeah. So, I love you. In fact, I mean, if, if you know the organizer of GRP's, I'd love to, if you can put him in touch because yeah, I want to get yeah, some yeah, put, uh, organi organizational yeah. know-how because they have a long-standing experience. Yeah. They well, want to but, replicate so that for the oil industry. Uh, 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 who's Italian, but he, he has been uh, leading uh, GRP'sa in the last few years. So I belong exactly. to the... Uh, uh, steering committee and so this is the first time we you know last two years the meetings were held online for obvious reasons uh, but this time they want to have it in person so then i said okay then you know i need to also get out uh, uh, you know and uh, uh, you know, i really need to get out I'm, I'm just sort of my whole professional life has come to a very strange kind of a place because <laughs> you know, i used to travel all the time and organize my professional life around them and now i just you know this endless kind of days and evenings <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, Let's so anyway, um, I'll definitely put you in touch with uh, Tomaso. Thank you. Because, uh, I appreciate And then we talk. Uh, yeah, and sure. going to Paris is not going to hurt you. Don't worry. Yeah. So. And you're not so far from Mexico either. Uh, <laughs> no, I am not. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I am not. Uh, in fact, uh, how long are you there in Mexico? Uh, for a while or? No, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working here. My, 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 I'm living here. Personal life. <laughs> so you're living years. Years. How yeah. long? Right. Yeah, I will stay here. So, so I Ten hope years. that we'll, like, yeah, 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 have, sure. have an opportunity to right. to invite you to Mexico also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I actually, uh, not too long ago, maybe a year or two ago, I was uh, I joined a, God, I think it's a, one of those science type of Mexican universities and I'm trying to think, uh, but they have a little on, they have a journal and I think they, I joined the editorial board on that. Mm. Uh, it's a, it's a Mexico, Mexico based journal. I'll, I'll, I'll dig it up and, and, and I'll let you know. Uh, although not that I have done anything for them yet. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know. <laughs> It'll be a time. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. I want to thank you. I, I love you. Thanks, Stephen. <laughs> and you'll be in touch. And, uh, yeah. All right. Take care. Take care. Thank you, Irina.